So thank you very much. That's always super incredibly helpful for me to know who's here, make sure we are hitting the right targets and giving you the information you want. So for today's workshop, we are going to look a little bit about why we might be interested in California native gardens at all. And we'll also cover all of those multiple benefits. Then look at how to get started with the design. We'll take some inspiration from our local wild or natural plant communities. Then we'll delve into the different elements of native garden design. And after we've looked at those elements, then we'll talk some about choosing plants. Following that, then we'll look at the design process, looking at a detailed example. And then at the end, we'll look at the basics of using native garden design for wildlife habitat, then to be supplemented if you want to learn more with that other workshop we have online. And then finally, we'll do some wrap up additional resources and have plenty of times for questions at the end. So for those of you who have joined us for a landscape transformation basics class, you'll see a few of the same slides, uh, but don't worry, most of the content is different and where the slides overlap, where we have time in this workshop to get much more into detail about some of the lessons we can learn from those slides. But we're gonna start with a basic premise, which is in Southern California and most of the areas that people are joining us from today, landscapes do take up quite a bit of space. We can definitely make the case that maybe we have too much pavement, that we sometimes have roads that are wider than we need or parking lots that are larger than we need. But if we look at our local communities from an aerial photograph, for most of us, it's quite different than downtown Los Angeles or New York. There's quite a bit of green or depending on the season that the photograph was taken, brown. And for a long time in our urban and suburban neighborhoods, especially in the front yards, the the real question for front yard design has been, does it fit in with the neighbors or the expectations? And if people wanted to go a little bit beyond that, the question was then just gonna be, what does it look like? And what it looks like is important. We should all have beautiful gardens. I wanna see other beautiful gardens in my community. But the last series of droughts really saw a proliferation of different types of landscapes going in a community and homeowners associations can no longer require people to have lawns in the front yard. They can have standards, but at the state level, people are protected for the right to move towards a water-wise landscape on their properties if it's a single family home. And so with that, a new question I think has had the opportunity to emerge, which is beyond what it looks like what do our landscapes do? And one of the biggest takeaways from today's talk is California native landscapes do more for us. Yes, they are beautiful, but they do so much more and require so much less than a traditional landscape that I really believe in the year 2020 with the resource problems that we are collectively facing that the California native landscape should pretty much be the new default, which means I'm not going to tell you that you need to remove every inch of lawn from your landscape to be a good person. By all means, if you need a small patch of lawn for your dog, if your kid's learning to play soccer, those are good reasons to have a lawn and good reasons to put that input of resources into having a lawn but most of us don't use our lawns. And so what I feel like in the landscape world and for a lot of homeowners I talk to is collectively we're looking for what's the new default landscape, the new lawn, a couple of roses landscape. And I think California native landscapes have the potential to do that for all of those benefits. And you know, for me, I also like growing fruit trees. I like growing vegetables. And so I have areas where I do that and I use those resources for that. But then the other areas default to beautiful California native landscapes with all the benefits. And we will explore those benefits in detail. So what is a California native plant? Starting with that, just to make sure that we are all on the same page, because a lot of people who I talk to confuse maybe water wise and low water plants with California native plants. So rosemary, 
it's a low water Mediterranean plant. It's actually from the Mediterranean basin. Same thing with lavender, uh, great plants. I have rosemary in my herb garden. I have lavender in my herb garden, but they're not California native plants. Lantana is a low water plant that's very popular, not a California native plant. A California native plant is a plant that evolved essentially in California. It's generally to simplify it, uh, as much as possible. It's a plant that's been here for a very long time, basically before Europeans reached California and brought many new seeds and plants with them, which some of them started then uh, reestablishing themselves in the wild here, like the yellow mustard that we see in the hills in the spring and early summer. And what makes them special? Well, if we are talking about California native plants from a similar climate, then to where we are living, then they have adaptations to our conditions, which means that they are adapted to our soils, to our natural rainfall patterns. We probably still in our home gardens will water them a bit in the summer to keep them looking fresher rather than going completely dormant as some of them might do, but they are overall adapted to our conditions. And that's if we are working with plants from similar or maybe slightly more extreme climates. So for example, the redwood forest is in California. Redwoods are California native plants. But when I say California native plants, that's going to be a shorthand for California native plants adapted to your region. So here uh, where we're located in the Inland Empire in Southern California, that means plants from our local plant communities, from our local mountains, even some of our more coastal areas, all the way throughout into the desert where some of those desert plants grow really well for us, but we're not talking about the rainy areas of far Northern California. In far Northern California, you might not be able to grow some of those desert plants. But overall with the native plants, we have plants that are perfectly adapted to our conditions and those plants because they evolved here have unique and special relationships with other native plants and animals. And so really what you can get are plants that are not only beautiful and tough, but plants that provide food resources for a variety of bees, not just our common European honeybees, but specialist bees, wasps, that some of those wasps then eat our pest insects in our garden. Uh, they attract insects in a good way that provide bird food. A lot of our native butterflies or caterpillars can only feed off of a very narrow spectrum of plants. And a lot of those are native plants and caterpillars are absolutely required to raise some species of baby birds. And so by working with these locally adapted native plants, we are kind of unlocking a whole ecosystem on our properties and in our neighborhoods. And why would we want them in our gardens? So I want to tell you a little bit about my morning this morning. I always like to leave a few slides and take a few pictures the morning that I do this presentation because my partner and I, have a relatively large backyard. We have a mostly California native backyard and a fully California native front yard. Uh, on our property, we have, because we're plant collectors and we're both horticulturists, we have a little over 225 species and cultivars of California native plants. Not something I would recommend for the average person, but in any yard with a carefully planned diversity of native plants to have things blooming throughout the year, you will unlock kind of magic and every morning in its own way, even if it's a smoky, overcast, kind of gross morning and a kind of depressing week has something just absolutely magical about it. It's one of the things I love about native plants. And so my kind of relationship with my backyard started this morning as I was at my kitchen counter that overlooks my backyard. And I saw a couple of doves who are constant residents in our yard this time of year because doves are seed eaters off the ground. They're scavengers. And so you can see here, there's a lot of really beautiful stuff going on in my yard year round, but this red buckwheat, which is one of my favorite plants after our record heat wave, just kind of sometimes does go semi dormant. It'll be back in the fall. But the seeds of it are what these two doves were walking around uh, eating. So started taking pictures out my window. And then I went outside to find goldfinches gleaning the dried seeds from the dried flowers of a native white sage. 
I missed getting the hummingbird in the air because they're really hard to photograph, but you can see here one of our local resident hummingbirds with a little insect in its beak because hummingbirds don't just drink nectar, they also rely on insects for a lot of their diet. And our yard has plenty of insects for bird food. However, we very rarely have mosquitoes because we have such a constant population of birds that hunt insects that it really helps keep the balance. Occasionally we have one, but uh, much less than other yards that I have lived in in the local area that uh, don't have this constant predator population for those insects. It really helps keep the balance. Still have some really nice spots of beauty and color, especially this time of year in our high, high heat. Some of the California native desert plants are doing really well. So this is a young desert willow and underneath it is a young justitia or chuparosa. Hummingbirds love both of those flowers. And you can see there's a few things that are in their semi-dormant stage. And if you really don't like that, you can definitely work with native plants that are a more constrained palette of things that stay fresh looking. But to me, allowing some plants to go semi-dormant that just have that look in summer, although you still have a nice looking structure, unlocks some of the really most beautiful plants for the spring that are just glorious in the spring and then maybe less so in the peak of summer. And so you have choices for how you're going to want to design things. And so even with the disgusting sky and the strange sunrise, lots of beauty in the garden. Also have pretty much constantly companion of uh, tohis this time of year. Tohis are, sorry, this is a black Phoebe. Uh, tohis coming later. Uh, so this is black Phoebe this time of year and black Phoebes are aerial acrobats. They are uh, standard birds, they're songbirds, they're different than hummingbirds, but they are so agile that they can hover in place as well and they're insect eaters. And so they're constantly on the power lines or on the sprinklers uh, that are sticking up in the yard on perches looking for insects to harvest out of the garden. Here are our tohi couple coming out of a bramble of a native grape at the edge of our property. These are seed eaters. And so they come around and eat the dried wildflowers this time of year. We'll have goldfinches and there's probably somewhere between 20 and 35 goldfinches in the yard this morning eating dried seeds off the stems of the plants. And then when they fall, just like the doves, the tohis bounce around on the ground. And so sometimes California native gardens can have a little bit of a reputation of looking dried out in the summer. And certainly that is one of the mistakes that sometimes beginning native gardeners make. They might plant too many different sage plants which have absolutely glorious flowers in the spring, but then this time of year are a little bit more dormant. But you can really achieve a balance by doing your research and making sure that you balance the plants that are really at their peak in the spring with plants that are at their peak in the late summer to early fall, which includes all of the range of native buckwheats. And so here you can see our local California buckwheat in the background and then a buckwheat hybrid called Blissanum buckwheat, buckwheat uh, right here, just absolutely gorgeous. And then we have Palmer's mallow, desert plants still in bloom over here, and woolly blue curls, which is one of my favorite plants. It's one to be careful with if you are a new gardener because it's really easy to overwater and kill. So you wanna put it in a spot where it gets hardly any water at all after its first year. And then in our little bit more irrigated zone, still looking really good, this gets some water from our fruit trees. We have California goldenrod and red buckwheat. And working with California native plants, it gives you the ability to really appreciate some of the subtleties that are lost with more conventional gardening. So for example, with a rose, you're gonna be deadheading right away as soon as those blooms fade. Where with our buckwheats, the blooms kind of fade into this dry rust color and the contrast between the, flesh fl the fresh flowers and the dried ones are just a really big part of the high summer to, to uh, early fall beauty. And so you can see here talking about that seasonal change. This is an area of all native annual wildflowers that we seed or oftentimes now uh, don't really need to put many new seeds in, maybe just if we wanna increase the, the diversity of the different plants, but these seeds will 
replant themselves. And certainly if you are living in an urban wildland interface area where there's fire danger, you are going to want to make sure that this is cleaned up, that these are mowed down uh, soon after they dry out. But we are in the middle of urban Pomona in an area where fire danger is really not a concern for a small wild flower patch like this. And so we have just a saucer as a bird bath that we keep filled, refresh the water every morning with the hose on just an old log from a tree. And we have glorious, beautiful colored wildflowers and lots of pollinators earlier in the year. And this time of year, all of the seed eating birds descend. So these things become bird feeders. So even though they're brown and they might have their own subtle beauty, I think it's beautiful, those subtleties of the shades, but some people might just see it as dried out. But even then, the color that comes to it is the goldfinches and the towhees and the doves, even though the doves are kind of muted colors, they're beautiful. And that not only provides food for them, but they also scatter the seeds and then really enjoy the bird bath inside. So here you can see towhee overlooking that area on just a little old piece of concrete that I propped up as a garden ornament and another view of the high summer garden. And amongst all that, I went back in to fix my breakfast and immediately from inside saw a huge hawk swoop down into our grapefruit tree because with this comes the whole cycle of life and hawks, which are important to support as well, do eat small birds. And so with all the small birds, we bring the hawks into the yard and then saw him chasing off some of the goldfinches. He was not successful this morning. And so to abstract that a little bit more, why would we want these California native plants in our garden? Well, one of the easy first ones is beauty. These are some of my favorite native plants for the garden. And all of these are ones that would require water only about once a month after they're established in the ground in most gardens in our local area. And with that comes habitat, which I won't go too much more into because we just talked about that process with the journey through my garden in the morning. And it could look wild and naturalistic, or it could look more formal if you want. As long as you're using the plants and the principles. Resource conservation. Most native gardens are only watered deeply once a month in the summer after they're established, which is usually two years or so after planting. Uh, your general guideline for most of our local locations and most soils is going to be a deep watering once a week when things are young and then tapering off to about once a month. Depending on the plants, sometimes some plants appreciate a light sprinkle in between, but in general, you're gonna be using no more than 25% of what would have gone into even a not perfectly green lawn. And the ease of care. There is no such thing as a no maintenance garden unless you're just going with a complete naturalistic restoration garden, which still needs some care to get it going. Most of us are going to want to prune and groom our native landscapes a bit more than that. But really, mostly what we're looking at is larger cleanups in the spring and fall, depending on the plants. Most individual plants don't need to be touched more than once or twice a year, as long as they're planted well, spaced correctly. And when you do have to do the work, you're kind of working smarter and not harder. It's definitely less labor than if you take care of your own lawn, pushing that lawn mower every weekend, edging, and having to do that all throughout the summer. So this time of year in the native garden, really it's just weeding. If there's weeds blowing in from the neighbors, or if you have an old kind of weedy seed bank in your yard and you still have some stuff coming up, it's just the little bit of weeding, which normally gets less and less every year. And if you feel like it, maybe a little bit of, of deadheading some flowers. But most of that work is spring and in fall when it's really nice to be out there. And it's much more pleasurable work because it's mostly handwork. You generally don't need to use any gas powered or even electric equipment. And like right here, I'm 
pruning a hummingbird sage. And by the time I'm done with that, I smell absolutely great. And all of that makes our gardens a much more enjoyable place to live and to learn because throughout the season, there is always something different. And every year is a little bit different. The colors are constantly changing. The wildlife is often changing. There's a lot of birds that will be in our yard for part of the year and then back up to the mountain another part of the year. So just kind of seeing who's coming and who's going and how things are all doing and changing throughout the year. I love that for myself. And especially if you have kids or grandkids, it's really, really cool to be able to share that with them in your yards. I really like this quote from John Muir who says, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And that is deeply philosophical, but is something that you actually see in action once you start planting native plants in your yard. And especially, you know, you don't need all native plants to, to do this. And if you plant just you know, one small planter with native plants, you'll start to see it happening. But there definitely is a shift once you have a large enough area of native plants in your yard where you really start to see all these ecosystem functions starting to happen. Gardens are truly ecosystems. They're not just collections of plants like a bunch of sculptures uh, set out on the lawn. I really like this quote from Lady Bird Johnson, First Lady, who was one of the first nationwide proponents of working with plants local to the area. She says that native plants give us a sense of where we are in this great land of ours. I want Texas to look like Texas and Vermont to look like Vermont. And I am quite a bit more cynical than Lady Bird Johnson, but the way I think about it is that it costs a lot to live in California. And if I am lucky enough to have a patch of land where I could decide what happens, why wouldn't I want my landscape to be that typical lawn and roses, which this time of year is normally a highly resource consuming, even if you do your best parched imitation of an East Coast or even older than that, an old European landscape style. I'd rather wake up to the natural beauty of California every day and enjoy it every evening. And when I have to do my landscape maintenance, not be pushing a gas powered lawnmower, but be out there with my pruners and smelling great as I cut back great smelling plants. And it also gives your cat something really interesting to look at out the window. So here are some of our big ideas that are going to guide us through the day. A garden is a living ecosystem. And as such, a garden is a process. It's never finished and it's always in motion. So it's not something that needs to be put in all at once. This is the back corner of my yard, which was one of the last places we planted. And it can be done a bit at a time on the weekends. That's a very normal thing. It doesn't need to be done all in one year. Uh, if you have a big enough and diverse enough garden, there'll always be something that's maybe a little sickly or maybe something dying after a number of years, that's natural, especially for some of the smaller plants. But the majority of the system should be healthy and happy. And then eventually when one plant dies, you, know, you can reflect on it and think, was that the right plant in the right place? Is there anything I could have done different? But it's also then a chance to sometimes plant something new and exciting. I really try to, to make sure that the bones of the garden, the trees, the woody shrub, the really long-term plants are perfectly sited. But then sometimes for some of the smaller plants, I'll take a risk and plant something that uh, we'll see how it does. And it doesn't mean you're a bad gardener or a bad person if a plant dies. And thinking that way is liberating. It's more fun and it's much more interesting. You get to see the beauty and subtle things like the dried out wildflower meadow with the bird bath that provides food, which is part of a beautiful garden. It's not just about maximum amount of flower color all the time. Although in a well-planned native garden, you can have flowers every day of the year. This makes our gardening become based in a larger world of natural science, and it gives us a way to root our designs and our actions in the garden. It's much more about just reacting to the bugs on the roses and getting poisoned and spraying it. And that makes gardening success a lot easier because you're thinking about a system and you don't have to freak out if a single leaf turns brown on something. If something's been eating the leaves of your plants in a native garden, most often it's a caterpillar and you're supporting habitat of a butterfly that relies on that plant. 
But where do we start with all of this? One of the big ideas is that we don't start here. This is the plant sale at the California Botanic Garden where they have amazing plants and amazing staff to answer a lot of questions. And I don't mean to talk about it just about their garden. That's one of the best places to get plants and get the, the best advice locally. But you don't start at any nursery, even if it's one of the best ones. Because where you want to generally start, unless you're just looking for one plant to replace, if you're thinking about design, is much farther back. And we're going to focus mostly on the details of native plants in this workshop. But if you are also just starting to focus on design for the first time, I would encourage you to learn some more about general design, which I always encourage people first to start with their goals of the project before thinking about plants at all and figure out what those goals are. And so if you are thinking about a significant project that you're going to be designing, I encourage you to check out another design focused workshop that we have up on our YouTube channel, which is the do it yourself landscape design. And there we'll talk about much more general principles of where to start. But for the purposes of this native plant focused class, we're not going to start at the nursery yet. We're going to start with just a local example maybe out in the San Gabriel mountains. And we're not starting here because we want our gardens to look exactly like this. There's some really cool plants out here, but most of us and myself included want our gardens to look more garden-like than just completely raw, natural, wild garden. But I find a lot of inspiration in our local mountains. And particularly, we're going to go on a walk today throughout August in our last, what at the time was considered a historic drought. And the reason why is because that for me is a stress test. Whatever is going to be doing well out with no water in the middle of a historic drought in August are things that we should consider or systems we should consider for inspiration in our home landscapes. Because these plants, yes, individual plants definitely did suffer in that drought. And there are long term concerns with the shifting weather patterns about how some of our native ecosystems will adapt. However, what you can see is if we look back at this kind of projected timeline, our latest droughts are just kind of a blip compared to some of the mega droughts that California has had in the past. And overall, these plant communities are adapted to being able to cope with that. And so of those plant communities, some of those plants that do well in our gardens as well should really be considered. So here are important patterns to note as we look at this and we go on this walk, which was up above Pasadena, kind of near the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, up above the Arroyo there. Plant density and what is on the ground. And one of the reasons why I'm mentioning this is because a lot of people think if they're going to be moving in this direction, then we're looking at gravel and a plant here and a plant there because we're trying to save water and we don't want too many plants. But here's what naturally happens. We can see things like this. This is California coffee berry. This is one of my favorite long-term structural wood, woody shrubs for the garden because even with very little water or no water in this case, after it's established, it's evergreen and looking pretty good year round. We have young California fuchsias, which we'll see in flower later, coming up just in a natural mulch layer of leaf litter in the middle of this historic drought. Young coast live oak trees coming up in barely any soil at the edge of an abandoned roadway, <coughs> looking pretty good. California buckwheat starting to bloom and the beautiful seeds, these tassels on the mountain moho mahogany. Gorgeous datura, this is a wildflower of disturbed places. The seed pods are highly toxic, so most people won't grow them in their garden, but our local plants can support this kind of beauty with minimal, minimal resources. And then in a naturally slightly wetter area, we have native grape covering a whole hillside. This is laurel sumac, so evergreen shrubs growing in hardly any soil at all. And this rock face has got blasting afternoon sun. And then in some of the slightly more sheltered areas under an oak tree, again, in that wood and leaf litter, native asters 
Toyon, one of my favorite evergreen bushes, which also in a garden situation prunes it up really nicely into a small tree. And sugar bush, another great shrub. Then in an oak woodland is one of the most comfortable places to be in summer in the shade of an oak tree. It's just absolutely wonderful. It's where you want to be. So when we talk about our local ecosystems to emulate, I get so frustrated whenever I hear politicians who should know better saying, well, we do live in a desert. Parts of Southern California are desert, but oftentimes those people are in what are Mediterranean climate areas that support chaparral and oak woodlands as well. So desert isn't the only responsible landscape pattern for us. Manzanita, beautiful new growth, great color in August, and that beautiful red bark. And baby California sagebrush coming up resilient even in this historic drought. And so one of the key ways I think we can begin to think about how do we design a coherent native plant garden is through understanding our different local plant communities and then potentially either emulating one of those or designing our own plant communities. But with that understanding that that's what we are assembling, not just a random collection of pretty plants. So I already jumped to this area is not a desert and my rant on that. So our local key ecosystem types that we might want to emulate in our Southern California areas where we are still west of the true desert areas, which is I think most of the people who have joined us today are oak woodlands. Certainly if we wanna create sheltered areas, We're looking at the leaf litter, the grasses, although in this picture, a number of these are invasive grasses. There's lots of native grasses that would traditionally live there. The beautiful understory plants, that leaf litter creating these beautiful fungally rich soils. Most of the time when you see a mushroom in your garden, it's a good thing that's cycling nutrients. Or our chaparral areas, slightly drier, a lot of beautiful plant diversity, a lot of seasonal color. And so even these dry slopes are mostly covered with plant material. We're not seeing huge gaps in between the plants in most of the areas. And that's an important lesson for us to extrapolate into our garden because if we have wall to wall, whether it's gravel or even wood chips and our plants just spaced far in between, what's gonna come up in between are weeds and that's gonna be more maintenance. Beautiful clematis. And so with different soil types, you do get different plant densities and different plant communities from the sages to the beautiful light blue, highly dense ceanothus in the spring, a little bit higher elevation in the San Gabriels and the beautiful glowing seed heads of mountain mahogany. So I'm starting to intersperse some pictures of naturalistic designs that I have done and worked to install that are inspired by some of these plant communities. So this was a berm at uh, my last place I worked was the Huntington Library and Botanical Gardens. I was the landscape design and planning coordinator there. We had a large project redoing the entrance. And so some of the areas were focused on native plants. And so this is kind of a tapestry approach with a minimum of botanical diversity. Uh, this was kind of off to a side area, but really focused on a tough kind of dwarf chaparral plant community because we had a blasting sun area and with how that area was built up, the soil wasn't great after construction. And then moving more towards the center of the garden, we worked with a hedge work to kind of formally define the space, which was a Mediterranean native, but not a native hedge. And then a collection of native and Mediterranean plants, all from mostly similar areas to chaparral, kind of some of them equivalents in other uh, areas that are Mediterranean climates, but a lot of native plants, again, kind of evoking that, but in a more cultivated space. Oak savanna is one of my favorite plant community types. This is Santa Rosa Plateau. It's one of my favorite wild places where we have oak trees, grasses, shrubs, wildflowers. And so here's a picture from a 
landscape architect that I really like, Bernard Trainer, where he has these incredible properties with very fancy homes that he works on. And he sometimes just works on a very naturalistic approach, but pulling so much beauty out of a very naturalistic approach to oftentimes working with established trees and then reestablishing a natural understory. I am usually working, especially with residential situations with much smaller budgets, but some of the same principles can come true. So this is spring in a small native meadow uh, that I had established with my partner and a former backyard of ours where we had some native grasses. And this is Cistrinchium bellum, which I am trying to remember the, uh, the English name for right now. Uh, and it's escape, baby, uh, sorry, no, it's escaping me. It'll come back to me, but a, a great little seasonal wildflower. Uh, riparian areas. So there are areas that are blue-eyed grass. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, blue-eyed grass, which is one of my favorite little perennials to tuck in here and there, and we'll see it around the garden. Uh, so riparian areas are natural as well. Again, we're not all dry. And so Oftentimes we won't set up big riparian areas in our home gardens because they take a good amount of water, but some of the favorite plants from them can show up next to our water features, or if you have a gray water system installed, it's a great way to add additional diversity and habitat value by getting some inspiration from there. I really like the look of uh, this area as just kind of natural inspiration, not a direct what I would do in a garden. This is in San Diego County and seeing how the kind of diverse meadow sage scrub ecology then meets in the wetter area with more trees and riparian. And so this is an example of a landscape that I did outside of an art gallery where we were kind of copying that a very simple. There's some more seasonal color that would grow in, but taking direct inspiration from that. And so I think there's a couple of ways to use plant communities as a basis for design. The first one is you can decide on a concept or a feel you want to achieve. This might be if you are out hiking somewhere and really love you know, a couple of different areas or you know the kind of plant community. And then you might think, well, I want this part of my yard or I want my front yard or my backyard to feel like this. I want it to one day feel like an oak woodland. I want it to feel like my favorite part of you know, the coastal sage scrub in the spring. And then you might not directly use all of those plants, but you'll choose the plants that make the best garden subjects based on some research. I'll share some resources with you later on in this presentation. Or you'll take some of those main plants and then mix them with some other ones appropriate to that plant community. And that in some ways is a nice and easy way for a, some, a gardener who's beginning with California native plants to achieve success in a coherent look that's going to evoke that feel that you're looking for. Definitely a viable goal. Or on the other side, you can fall in love with individual native plants that you like and then design them into the right spaces, really making sure you focus on putting the right plant in the right place. So really understanding the sun requirements, the sh if there's shade requirements, matching the moisture levels that different plants want, really taking into account the full size it's going to get. And you can assemble your own kind of novel coherent plant community, thinking about the different things that you would want, a balance of shrubs, ground covers or small perennials? Are there going to be grasses in there? Are you going to have trees that are going to be growing in? Thinking about how to create a full space rather than just getting a bunch of flowering shrubs and cramming them too close together, which is oftentimes what uh, beginning gardeners will do. And that's not to say that if you want a bunch of flowering shrubs, if that's your concept, you know, go for it. But sometimes what happens is that People get excited about the flowers and they don't do as much research on that right plant, right place, thinking about assembling their own personal plant community. And what happens is things start growing and if plants are growing well at six months to one year, everything looks great. But then by year three or year four, sometimes those shrubs are all growing too much into each other. Uh, the garden space doesn't really feel like a welcoming garden sometimes. It kind of just feels overgrown. And if plants are too close together, uh, 
heavy pruning needs to start happening. The beautiful natural forms of the plants are sometimes lost. And so this is the time in the design phase to think about setting up your own personal plant community. What are going to be the shrubs or small spaces in between? What are going to fill those small spaces? How to assemble that all? And then we'll look at resources for figuring out those plants. Realistically, I think for a lot of people, the best approach is going to be somewhere in between those two, where you can maybe start with a strong concept or pictures of a feel you want to evoke, maybe from a natural area, maybe from someone else's garden that you've seen that you like, and maybe not sticking to all those exact plants, supplementing, but starting with that strong inspiration and then supplementing with other plants you like to create your custom plant community. And by doing this, we can really set ourselves up nicely for success. And so here is one example of a picnic area that I designed based on a native oak woodland. However, if you're starting an oak woodland from scratch, you also need to take into account the fact that it's going to take quite a number of years till the area is truly shady. And so you're going to be starting maybe with a mix between a woodland and maybe like local chaparral, kind of some of those pictures I saw where the two plant communities are coming together. And oftentimes those are places that can really beautifully have a lot of nice diversity in the plants. And so the planting happened in February, 2015, after doing our rock work and our path work. And so you can see here, the young trees. And this is August of the same year. So things can really get going, especially if you plant in that peak season, where February I consider a little bit past peak season, but not too bad, but really that uh, right before Thanksgiving through kind of Christmas and New Year. And so here we go with the young oak woodland ecosystem. Some things get growing slower than others. So this is Toyon, which I mentioned before, but you can see our buckwheats and our sages and our sage brushes really get going quickly. Filling in those spaces, those sunny spots between the oak trees nicely until things grow in. This is narrow leaf milkweed. It's one of our main monarch butterfly habitat plants. Native asters, which are pretty aggressive ground covers, but will fill the space between the oak trees and really be able to handle a lot of that transition from full sun to part shade over the first few years. And any garden where a lot of plants are planted, you always lose one or two. So don't beat up on yourself if that happens. Working with beautiful grasses that can catch the light. So all that in less than a year. So if you plan it out and get it going, it won't be that long. And then the next year, there'll be a lot less open mulch, a lot more together. So California fuchsia starting to bloom in the late summer, attracting hummingbirds. And then we'll go over a few more principles and then stop and answer questions. So if you have questions, remember to keep them coming in. Another guiding principle that I like, and this is something that uh, kind of talking about it this way, I learned from uh, Mike Evans, who runs Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano. They do a lot of great free programming. They've been doing online workshops, have great information on their website. So I encourage you to check out their resources. It's consider creating a story or a concept for your garden, going so far as a narrative that you might want to write out. And by kind of thinking about that and writing that out gives you another really guide to then process as you're pulling in your individual plants. And so for the place that my partner and I live right now in Pomona, the concept for our front yard, which we'll look at later in terms of the design, is a native woodland or eventually will feel like a woodland when things grow in. Our house is a bird blind. You saw the pictures that I took from my kitchen. Uh, that's kind of common. We do bird watching from inside the house and have strategically set things up to where we have bird baths and views that will allow us to do so. And our backyard is a native plant collection slash an orchard meadow where we have fruit trees with meadow native plants that provide a lot of bloom and habitat, but like that slightly higher irrigation that our orchard's getting and a vegetable garden as well, where a lot of the birds that are here for our native plants that also eat insects really do help keep some of our vegetables with a lot less pest pressure, especially for certain things like aphids. 
Sometimes they also get into some of our young lettuce plants and things like that. So it gives and it takes, but overall this whole ecosystem is just a pleasure to be in. So you can think about what you would want your story for your garden. And if your garden surrounds your house, maybe your house and how it interacts to be as well. And if gardens are also habitat for people, they need space for people. So it's really easy to get excited about the plants and fill your garden with beautiful, colorful shrubs, and then realize that long term as things grow in, it's really hard to walk around in and to enjoy and to do your maintenance. And you find yourself trapped on the outside looking into the garden. Gardens need an entrance, they need paths, even if it's just a well designed wide enough gap in the mulch layer. They need paths or other features that will define those planted areas and make sure that you're leaving enough space for you to be in there or your family to be in there or your friends to enjoy it all. And so this will be our first spot to stop and answer some questions. So first question, how do you keep the weeds out? Uh, well, there's a combination of answers, Ray. The first one would be doing the best to make sure that you are taking care of the weeds before you start planting. So if you're interested in more information on that, there is a turf removal class that we have where we do three hours of just uh, how to remove turf and all of those methods work really well if you have high weed seed loads as well. Uh, short answer is one of my favorite things to do is called cardboard mulching or sheet mulching where we put down recycled corrugated cardboard that we scavenge from various places as a biodegradable weed barrier that will last between six months and a year, depending on the moisture levels. And it'll basically smother the weeds and a lot of the seeds underneath. And then by the time that that's breaking down, a few more weeds get through. Uh, it's never 100%. You always have to do some weeding, but the, the weed problem is, is far less than it would have been otherwise. And usually by then the plants are starting to grow in as well. And the more your plants grow in and start to shade the soil and start to over time drop their own leaves, the less weeding you have to do. If you only have one plant here and one plant there and a lot of space in between, you're going to have a lot of weeds. And if you live in an area prone to wildfire, there's going to be local guidelines for how far apart you should plant your shrubs and you kind of need to follow that. But for the most part, by balancing that plant density and taking care of things ahead of time, some weeds might blow in from the neighbor's yards, but you can get on top of it and stay on top of it. And then when you do need to go out and do your weeding, yesterday I needed to spend uh, an hour or so catching up on some weeding in my front yard because I just have not wanted to be out late with the heat and the fires, spent the morning doing that, but you're out in a beautiful garden doing your weeding. Uh, so next question from Sharice regarding watering and irrigation. We, if we wanted to skip a drip irrigation system, can we successfully establish California native garden by hand watering only? Uh, yes, you absolutely can. It's going to require that you interact more with your landscape, but that might be a good thing. So uh, there's a portion of my backyard that my partner and I take care of that we don't have an ir a set irrigation system on. We do it with hose watering or sometimes when we need to water down the whole area deeply, we'll use an old style oscillating fan sprinkler that will run early in the morning uh, where there's not gonna be a lot of wind and there's not gonna be a lot of evaporation. So I can give you some more tips on that. The main thing I will say is most often when people hand water, you, uh, they water, they don't end up watering deeply enough and sometimes they water too often. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that like you were running an irrigation system well, you, when you do hand water, you want that water to penetrate at least a foot. So it might be some trial and error at the beginning to water some and then dig outside the root ball to see how deep it's penetrated. You're going to want to invest in a good watering wand with a good nozzle for it and I would say join us for our installation and establishment of California native plants class because I'll get way more into how you can make sure that you are achieving that with your watering. In the design class, we just don't have the time to get much deeper into it than that. Uh, from Susan, any reason not to use hybrids of California natives? So Susan's probably getting towards a question around habitat value for wildlife uh, because there have been 
some studies, and this is kind of globally, not focused on California for any of that I've seen, that show that some of the bred cultivars of plants that might be native to an area really don't support the wildlife as well because they've been bred to have specific uh, factors like maybe super showy flowers and those flowers then might have a different form or ruffles that aren't really accessible. So Susan, I would say I don't have any scientific evidence on it, but I do feel that most of the cultivars and even hybrids, and there's not a ton, a ton of hybrids around, like there are some hybrid buckwheats that I grow, uh, are probably still going to be just as valuable to wildlife. So for example, uh, the hybrid that I showed, the Blistianum buckwheat, that is technically a hybrid, but it's one that occurs naturally. And it's still going, if you look at the, the flower clusters, uh, still see a lot of insects on them, just like all the other buckwheats and the seeds are still going to be just as attractive for the wildlife. And then a lot of our cultivars are different than the cultivars in other areas where some of them are just for a specific flower color, but they occur out of natural populations. It's just one that's selected. So certainly if you're gonna plant a thousand of them on a huge ranch, maybe go with the species that's propagated from seed for that biological diversity. But if you're choosing one or two from your garden, uh, I don't worry about choosing cultivars. From Peggy, firescaping with native plants. Uh, that is a big topic that we don't have a ton of time to get into today, but I can give you some resources to check out. Uh, the first one is your local fire area is going to have general guidelines for uh, how, how many feet from the house to have no plant material. Oftentimes that's five. And then you're going to have another zone where you're going to want to keep it more irrigated. Uh, in that zone, that's a great place for fruit trees or vegetable gardens, or maybe like a moist meadow ecology, something where you might have grasses or yarrow that you can water on a weekly basis during the fire season and that they'll uh, like it. So then you're going to get farther out and that's when you can start working with native shrubs. You'll find that there's some native shrubs, sometimes, oftentimes they're the ones with oils that just if you do your research have a reputation for being highly flammable. You'll stay away from those but there's a huge selection of other ones that will be perfectly appropriate. And then you're gonna work with guidelines of spacing in between the canopies of those shrubs or trees. And again, there's gonna be local guidelines for that no matter what the plant material is. You might wanna check out, there's an author. He also teaches workshops by the name of Doug Kent. And he has a book that's just come out with a new uh, edition on firescaping and that might be worth checking out. Moving on, where can I find seeds for native? What's the best season to plant seeds for natives? So I'll answer that now, Gladys, because later on, uh, we'll talk mostly about sources for the woody plants. And at some of those same nurseries, especially the, I know, Theodore Payne Foundation, the Grow Native Nursery at California Botanic Garden, and Tree of Life Nursery as well, they do carry seeds. For most home gardeners, you're going to be planting seeds of native wildflowers. So most of the plants that we're showing, the woodier shrubs, the trees, even the perennials, those can technically be propagated by seeds, but most of the time home gardeners won't find success. You need a really good setup. It takes quite a long time. So the native wildflowers, the annuals that you would toss out are best to be tossed out in the fall, right before the first rains and then they will grow in the spring and bloom in the spring to early summer mostly. Few of them will grow, keep blooming into the summer. A lot of questions coming in. I think what we will do, thank you for all the questions. This is a great group. I think what we'll do now is we will, and a lot of these questions are not directly related to what we are uh, talking about at the moment. So I think what we will do now is we will keep going and then what I will ask there's a lot of good questions but but when I stop for questions it will be best to focus on questions that are what I've just spoken about if there's general questions uh, I definitely am happy to answer all of them but those might have to wait till after the end of this particular workshop and then we'll just we'll just keep talking uh, past noon so hopefully you have time so with that, we will 
transition to talking about the basic elements of landscape design. Here are some good things you should be thinking about in terms of how to structure your garden, maybe the parts of your garden before we start talking about plants themselves. These are the considerations that most of the time you'll think of even before plants. And then we'll also include some plants as well. So the first one we'll talk about is landform, which includes things like moving soil, maybe to create a depressed area, if you need to level an area for a patio, if you need to move or soak in rain with a dry stream bed or an infiltration basin, if you want to change a perspective of an area, alter the drainage, any of that sort of stuff. That's obviously stuff you want to figure out before you really start figuring out your plants. So this is a picture of my backyard in the process of being planted and also the infrastructure being put in, but we had to do a, a bunch of of moving soil around for the landform. So for example, uh, this area sloped gen gently down from uphill to downhill following the mouse. And what we did is our, this patio was way too big and, and pretty broken up for first from some uh, weed trees that had been there, some big ash trees that came up from seed. And so I broke up about a third of it. And this area I leveled by pulling soil from up to down and set up a permeable broken concrete patio over here that would be planted in between. I dug out soil down here to create a final depressed sunken meadow that could flood seasonally, collecting water all the way around from the front of the house down through what is in this picture an in-construction dry stream bed through here. And with that soil, I created a terrace, leveling that off, providing a higher planting area along this patio and a space for a bench with the feet down in the sunken meadow and some kind of gently uh, put together rock terraces for little plant pockets just with the rock dug up in the process. So thinking about those sorts of things, because then that will set up the different areas like the area that floods, which will get a different selection of plants than the areas in this fill soil up here. If you're interested in more details about that sort of stuff, especially with capturing rain in January, we're going to be teaching a whole rainwater harvesting for home gardens workshop. And so I encourage you to join us for that. Other basic elements related to design, exposure, the sunny areas and the shady areas. And know that full sun doesn't necessarily mean in terms of plant requirements, full blasting sun all day in Southern California. Full sun means six or more hours of direct sunlight. And so you can have an area that gets morning through noon sun that can still be considered a full sun area or an area that gets midday through evening sun. Uh, or it can be full blasting sun. And then part shade means maybe a little bit of direct sunlight, but mostly at least some dappled shade throughout the day. And then shade means really no direct sunlight in most situations. So there's a number of California native plants that when you see shade, that means if they get really direct sunlight in the summer, they will burn. And then on microclimates, what that means is any particularly hot or cold areas in your yard. So for example, an area that's planted that's right next to an asphalt driveway that gets full blasting sun in the afternoon will not only get the direct afternoon sun, but it will get the reflected heat from that driveway or up against a west facing wall where you're gonna have reflected heat back off that wall onto the plant as well as the direct sunlight. And so those particularly hot microclimates might be areas where you might wanna work with some beautiful desert shrubs that will take all of that extra heat and just respond with more flowers in the summer. Instead of some of our local chaparral shrubs, they're just not used to that, especially if you're in an area where there's kind of the urban heat island situation going on. Uh, they're just, they might live, but they, they might suffer a bit from all that extra heat. Another, area kind of sort of talking about microclimates a little bit different because it deals with moisture is, for example, this is a water feature in my backyard where it doesn't use a whole lot of, of water and we get a lot of habitat value out of it. But this is also the area where we've put a few perennials and some sedges, uh, grass-like plants that require a little bit more water, but it's just in this one little small micro area that gets just a little bit of splash 
from the water feature. And that's enough to kind of change that to where if we put this out in one of our full sun kind of typical areas in the yard, these plants wouldn't be happy. That's a native stream orchid floating in that water feature. Repetition, starting to talk about plant design. Repetition is one that can really help, especially beginning gardeners create a coherent look. So sometimes we default to too much of a one of this, one of that. And so this is a commercial landscape, but what happened is all along this one edge of this commercial landscape, which is the, the main view of this landscape on this bed is from the other side. And then this is the background of that central path. And we wove a collection of just three plants, native black sage, uh, the uh, Cleveland sage hybrid called, called Worley blue sage with the purple flowers and California sagebrush. And it wasn't a direct one, two, three, one, two, three. It's kind of a naturalistic, but a limited species of plants, mid-sized shrubs that provided a repetition in the backdrop that created a sense of uh, coherency to the larger planting. And then on the left, this is just a solid block of one plant. This is alkali sacaton, which is a beautifully flowering native grass, just to provide a sense of this block right there. Massing is another one. That's just deciding that you're gonna take an area and do a large swath of one plant. So just like that other grass on the left, what would be considered massing. So this is native deer grass and there was an established tree in this area with pretty aggressive roots. And we went with just a simple meadow of the native deer grass and dotted here and there, there's another accent, but mostly it's the mass of that deer grass. So you get that, uh, that balance that just kind of simple because what this is about is about the tree and then just the individual accents and each accent pops a little bit more because of that mass of the deer grass. And so in a residential situation, you might not have a mass this big. You might end up doing something just like all along the wall of your backyard that is this big, but still that concept of massing instead of one, maybe three or five of the same plant in certain conditions can really help create a kind of polished look and is actually pretty beneficial for habitat as well. So for example, with a mass of deer grass, which I always like to try to include in my home garden somewhere, even if it's you know, five plants instead of the 30 that are here, when the goldfinches come this time of year to eat the little seeds out of it, then uh, they can go from one plant to one plant quite a lot easier. Surprise is another fun thing to work with when you're working with any sort of planting and native plants as well. So that might be something like going around a curved path and all of a sudden you see some shrub that's beautifully brilliant uh, in flower, you know, sometime of year and it really catches your eye or even small details. So in this little broken concrete and walk wall, tucking in our native succulents and dudleyas kind of here and there and you just sort of catch it and it's just a little pop of an extra detail. And when it comes to working with the plants themselves, I want to encourage you to think far beyond flower color. And in fact, don't think about flower color as the primary element. The reason why is because most plants don't flower the entire year. And a lot of plants only flower for maybe a month, sometimes three weeks, sometimes two months. And then they're in your garden for the entire rest of the year. And so even before flower color, when it comes to the aesthetic, the look part of the plant, I encourage you to think about texture. Oftentimes that's the texture of the leaves, like this hummingbird sage with the pink flowers, kind of the wider triangular leaf. And in the front, we have the native yarrow with the ferny type leaf. We have the grasses with the thin leaf and then the sage on the right that's not in flower with the kind of more medium sized leaf. And then color, thinking about color of the leaves or sometimes of the bark on trees as more important than flowers. So the goal is if you're thinking about the look of your garden, that even if not a single plant is in flower, just looking at the different sizes, shapes, tones of green or gray in the leaves, that you're gonna have a nicely balanced looking attractive garden. And if you can achieve that, then the flowers are just kind of icing on the cake and the flowers can come and go throughout the year. 
if you really want to think about flower color, you can and bring that into the mix. But it's really difficult to achieve a beautiful, well-balanced looking garden if you are only thinking about flower color. But it is a lot easier to do that if you think primarily about these other factors and then integrate flower color if you want. Personally, I tend to not think about flower color very much when I'm doing design and just kind of go for that well-balanced look and the flower colors work themselves out quite well. So here's also textures working with ornamental grasses. So this is that alkali sacaton grass and then the color from the red buckwheat and the margarita BOP penstemon over here. So this is an example of not really worrying about colors and letting it work itself out in the springtime with monkey flower here, with coastal sunflower or California bush sunflower here, and then a riot of annual wildflower colors. Because even with color, in the flowers, sometimes people would say, oh, I don't want too many purple flowers in one spot or something like that. I, I, I tend to not worry about it because also there's so much subtlety. So here is a congregation of purple flower colors with Delamina verbena on the right, which is a native verbena, one of our top butterfly attracting plants and Margarita BOP or Margarita bot penstemon on the left. And so, yeah, they're both purple. If you think, well, they're, you know, okay, both purple plants, but there's so much contrast and so much depth into looking at the color between them. And then the final aspect that I'm going to mention right now is this concept called cues to care, which I think can really help us, especially in our California native front yards. And especially if you tend to like a landscape aesthetic, you might say that's kind of on the wilder side. So cues to care is a concept that was developed by an academic named Joan Nassauer, who did research into landscape psychology. Sorry, just having trouble getting that word out. Uh, specifically, she was looking at what makes people like certain types of landscapes and not like certain types of landscapes. In the state that she was working, the normal kind of wild pre-development plant communities were these highly diverse grassy meadows. So there'd be grasses, there'd be lots of flowering plants coming and going throughout the year. And people started to be doing these prairie restoration front yard landscapes in different communities around where she was working. And the reactions to them in the neighborhood were very different sometimes. Sometimes people loved them, thought they were beautiful, appreciated that they were adding to the ecosystem or providing habitat in their neighborhoods. And sometimes people were really upset, thought people had just abandoned their front yards, that the property values were going to be lowered, that you know, people were just not taking care of things and they were complaining to the local authorities. And it wasn't necessarily that the plants were different. And so she decided to investigate this and did this whole visual simulation study where she would take uh, very similar front yards, very similar planting, and just modify one or two factors to try to get to the bottom of what was creating these different reactions. And essentially, after all of that, she came up with something that at the surface we would find maybe very intuitive, that people like landscapes that they understand are intentional and cared for, and they don't like landscapes that they think are either abandoned or not cared for. And very simple things could be done to shift the balance of their perception. And those things she called cues to care. So for example, in the prairie front yard landscapes it could be something as simple as a picket fence and closing it, or because it was mostly grasses, a neatly mowed strip around the outside, a well-maintained path through it. And even if the neighbors didn't understand what was going on with the plants themselves, their, those cues to care could go a long way towards them giving the homeowner the benefit of the doubt or accepting or even liking the landscape. And so if we're gonna be working with the wild side of a California native planting, which again, may or may not be your aesthetic. And if you want to, you can have a less wild planting in your front yard. But this planting, if you just look at the plants themselves is pretty wild. 
However, I would say that with this fence here, with the little piles of rocks that show extra effort to kind of make things naturalistic, that this landscape is a lot less abandoned looking than if maybe you took away this fence, you took away those rocks, we look at some additional angles. You can see it's a very well-maintained and put in path to the front door. The, there's these additional factors that really tell you it's not just a wild abandoned front yard. A little patio set set up outside. So here's another example of a naturalistic front yard, but using this cue of the repetition of that one, two, three of these sulfur buckwheats, which is not something that would just randomly happen. And then again, a well-maintained clean path. The front of the house is well-maintained. The trim work is clean. All of those things can go a long way if you prefer a naturalistic aesthetic in your front yard to let people know that this is an intentional space. So again, well-maintained paths. Open. it looks like I accidentally repeated some of these images. Let's get through them really quickly. And so with those principles, we'll now turn to starting to look at some elements in the garden. Some of these being things that are not plants, but are things that you will want to integrate into your native garden as well. You'll see a number of these pictures are credited to the Theodore Payne Foundation Native Plant Garden Tour. Theodore Payne Foundation is a local nonprofit located in Sun Valley in the San Fernando Valley, dedicated to the promotion of native plants and their conservation. And a lot of their work revolves around native plant horticulture and urban gardening. And they have a great garden tour every year that I would encourage all of you to check out if you're interested in native plants. This year they had to do it virtually, but if you go to the website for the garden tour, which is nativeplantgardentour.org, you can see archives of this year and past year's uh, properties and lots of inspirational pictures. So some of these are from those and a number of these are pictures that I've taken on the tour as well. And so if you're interested in a more traditional look, here is a case of something that kind of emulates a more traditional lawn and shrubs. And then the time of year where this yarrow lawn is not blooming, it's just mowed down and looks low and green. And for a casual car passing by, they might not even realize it's not a lawn. And if you never want it to bloom, you can just keep mowing it. And then working with kind of the accent shrub, hedge, all those basic principles but sticking with California native plants. Now this does require quite a bit more pruning and hedging to keep everything tight like this, like that traditional landscape. Uh, the habitat value is not gonna be quite the same because of all of that, but it's going to be so much more than the traditional landscape that this probably replaced, so much more than lawn and roses. And so if you need a kind of cleaner looking, more traditional approach, uh, you can do that. And you can see here as well, there's some Australian plants, there's some uh, Mediterranean plants, but a lot of California native plants, a lot less water than what it replaced. If you only have a patio area, you, you're renting and you can't put anything in the ground or you only have paving, you can have a whole beautiful landscape in container plants. Or use container plants as accents or for getting different plants you don't have room for in the ground into your yard as well. Patio spaces are great to integrate into native gardens. Native gardens tend to not only be beautiful and bring interesting wildlife, but especially if you're working with the sages and the sagebrushes, they smell absolutely amazing. So I'm a fan of soft, permeable patio spaces that allow the water to trickle down through. So here's just a great example of a pea gravel patio space, comparatively very inexpensive to install for a patio, much less than you know, flagstone or pouring concrete, lets the rainwater soak in, has a nice kind of crunchy feel underfoot. 
or this front yard decomposed granite patio. And it's amazing sometimes with the wildlife, you, you sit down for just a few minutes and some of the more bold birds will come right back into the garden and you can sit there and enjoy your cup of coffee or glass of wine and just kind of be around everything. And then pathways through, because again, access, whether it's for your maintenance or just to comfortably walk through and enjoy your plants is essential. And that's up to your personality. So uh, I tend to like a wilder kind of garden and a very grown in look. And so in our backyard, our pathways are just the same wood chip mulch that we used as the initial mulch for the landscape and it's just the pathways are mostly defined as the gaps between the plants. In some areas it's edged with uh, some branches or rocks or some pieces of broken concrete that we had, uh, but that's just laid out on top of the mulch. And in some areas we do have to brush by the plants as they've grown in, but that's what we were going for and we're okay with that. Uh, a lot of people would prefer a more formally defined pathway. I really think that this decomposed granite edged by a natural river rock is about as beautiful as you can get for a naturalistic look that's going to have a, a well built in pathway. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Or it can be a combination of stretches of permeable decomposed granite with stretches that are paved. You can also look at large pavers. Sometimes you can get these precast depending on the size. Sometimes the concrete work would be done in place and then infilled with gravel in between to allow for permeability of the water to soak in and not wash off either into the street or towards the house. Or working with you know, gravel and river rock. If you are working with gravel like this, you are going to probably want underneath to either use some sort of weed barrier or even better than that, because weed barriers over time do either break down or and then also do sometimes show uh, through, making sure you do a really good job with weed control, watering, flushing out any weed seeds ahead of time. And then as long as there's no tree roots nearby, compacting the base as the best you can and then putting the gravel down over it. Or working with broken concrete, especially if in your garden renovation, you need to demolish concrete. You can, it's heavy, it takes some work to do, but either you or your landscaper can then reuse the broken concrete as basically as flagstones and create a permeable surface. It's a very modern look with square pavers. And I really like this because it's a clean modern look, kind of again, that cues to care thing with the decomposed granite in between that then just goes out into decomposed granite mulch and a very informal kind of wild garden, but still with shrubs, large shrubs, small shrubs, and then the lower layer can be very wild, but the, the bones of the landscape hold together. Looking at a mixture of decomposed granite, flagstone, cobble, and these are just normal hardware store pavers, but you can still create a great look into the more rustic, very naturalistic. Then also thinking about rainwater capture. So rainwater capture is a whole other topic. I do encourage you to join us for that full workshop. We'll have about it in January. And then also for those of you who are interested, we do once a month and we also have online our landscape transformation basics workshop, where we talk a little bit about design. There's some overlap with this class, a little bit about rainwater capture. So you can get some of that content there and then a little bit about turf removal as well. But one of the easiest things to do for where water is going to be falling down downspout is to replace that downspout with a rain chain that will both look really beautiful in your garden, will also slow down that water and decrease the velocity. So when it does hit the layer of your garden down at the soil or better onto the mulch, it's going to be moving slower and more able to be absorbed. And then thinking about mixing in things like dry stream beds strategically to hold on to and capture that water. Sometimes also turning water that naturally accumulates or already accumulates because of past grading on the property where you don't want it to somewhere where it can be much better served to help hydrate your garden and eventually help recharge the groundwater table. And I always encourage people to work with the local stone to their area around here. That's gonna be often called river rock uh, for a number of reasons. One, it requires less resources to bring it here and process, it's more widely available, it's often cheaper. And then aesthetically, your local material is going to be the one that you can get in the most different sizes. And so to have a nice look that mixes cobble, maybe some small boulders, some pea gravel, different sizes, 
you can get that with your local stone with the more ornamental some people say ornamental i don't think any of them look as nice as as this range of colors and tones and shapes in our local stone but those quote ornamental bag gravels you can usually only get them in one size and when it comes to actually building features in your landscape it they just look funny once once you have that much of it over that large of an area and so here you can see in a parkway capturing some water that would probably have run off of a driveway this is capturing water and bringing it around the side of a house. I really like how the designer and contractor here used some ter old terracotta roofing tiles to create a sharp edge in a narrow space to this feature. And even things like instead of a concrete walkway or replacing a concrete walkway with stepping stones with gravel in between, we'll get the vast majority of the water that would fall or come across this area to absorb and sink in right here instead of running it off to somewhere else to be dealt with. Just a few more examples. And then thinking creatively about what other features that you might want, like this highly extensive cat run in the Gottlieb Native Garden. It's a famous California native garden in Los Angeles. So being creative. And with thinking about all of those different factors, we can think about starting to then choose plants. So we've thought about looking at our site. Are we going to need pathways, patios? Are we going to be moving soil around? And as we think about how our spaces that we know that we're going to need to set up for access to go to different social spaces that we're going to have to serve different needs, uh, our landscape starts to be less of one big open area and it starts to be set up into smaller sections thinking about your full sun areas your part shade areas you, you start to understand that your landscape is going to break out into different zones and those zones maybe in, in one zone you know you need a, a small tree to shade your patio in the afternoon uh, three shrubs and some ground covers and another area you have room to have a whole hedge of different exciting native plants and in another area super hot microclimate so you're going to work with some desert plants there then you can start to actually choose your plants and so in a little while we're going to go through a whole design example doing some site analysis and going through that but i do want to show you a couple of top resources for choosing your plants if you are in southern california to inform that process the first one that I recommend, especially if you are a first time native gardener or just getting into it, only have a few plants, would be the Inland Valley Garden Planner. This is a website that our agency set up and it's about choosing and learning about uh, the information for the, the main factors that we talked about for getting the right plant in the right place and even the maintenance needs for the top 350 water wise plants that we'd encourage people to grow in Southern California. It's a lot of what you would be able to find in local nurseries, certainly specialty nurseries, like some of the native specialty nurseries uh, that I listed have more different plants than this, but we concentrated about a little over a third of the plants, over a hundred of the plants here are California native plants. And among those, we intentionally chose the ones that we feel are going to be the best for the average native gardener, uh, someone who is wanting to garden with native plants, but isn't necessarily wanting to spend most of their free time uh, caring for individual plants. They're not necessarily going to be passionate gardeners as that's their main hobby. They want to have a nice landscape and enjoy doing uh, the work when it's necessary. So there's definitely way more plants than that. Uh, sometimes California native plants have a reputation for being kind of tricky to maintain. We really focus this on the plants that generally are not tricky to maintain. There's lots of other ones that are not as well, but these are our top choices. Uh, most reliable in the inland heat. Uh, so I'd encourage you to use other resources and I'll share one with you, but this is a good kind of start here if you're interested. Now, if uh, you want to start with some more specific guidance, you can go right to garden styles, where here there are 16 kind of preset plant palettes, 
and a number of these focus on California native plants. If you already have some shade, like from a native oak tree, you might check out the California native, the Coast Live Oak native garden. And then for more general, we have a butterfly and songbird garden list, a pollinator garden list, and a California native color garden list. All of these will attract butterfly, songbirds, and pollinators, but it's more about the focus and then the color is focused on uh, plants that will then provide some amount of color year round, which then usually brings the pollinators as well. In addition to that, the woodland garden and the meadow garden are not 100%, but the vast majority of the plants in those are native uh, plants as well. And so just as an example, if you go to the butterfly and songbird garden, you will find some pictures at the top, but a description of the palette uh, plant list and we try to keep it relatively simple. So there are many, many other plants that are great for bringing butterflies and songbirds. But for the kind of simple front yard, we wanted to just give you an example of one tree, a few shrubs to choose from. Some require full sun, some are for shadier areas, a uh, list, small list of perennials, and the grass. So if you are just getting into it and just want some great recommendations to put together a perfectly beautiful landscape that does everything you would need for a butterfly and songbird garden, here you go right here. And then if you want to do more research, get excited about other plants, bring other things in, that's great. And you can use any of these plants as some of that kind of core backbone for that. And then each of these plants has additional pictures, description of the plant, the water needs with an irrigation schedule, and some more information about how to use that schedule. And certainly we will talk a lot more about irrigation, how to know how much, how deep, how long to water in both the class that we have coming up in October for transitioning from a lawn to a water-wise garden supporting irrigation system. We'll talk a lot about irrigation management and we'll talk some about it in that installation and establishment of native gardens class as well. And then just the basic factors that you're going to need to figure out the right plant in the right place, the height, the width, the flowering season it might be important, the soil adaptations. A lot of these plants want well during soil, but quite a bit of them can handle the heavier clay soils as well, and those will be there. And then different information. And then you'll also either need to know how to maintain these plants, or if you have a gardener or a landscaper, the reality is just that a lot of gardeners or landscapers, even if they do a good job and put the effort in, just don't have that much experience with these plants yet. And so you might need to provide this information for them so they know what to do. Uh, so for example, for some of these trees, uh, the pruning might not be that different than general tree pruning, but sometimes the season of which to do it relates to the growth season of the tree. And so those that information would be needed, especially when it comes to some of the shrubs or the perennials. The You want to prune them right before their main growth season. And some of them, that's the spring. Some of them, that's the fall. So if it's going to be pruned once a year, doing it at the right time of the year is really important to keep it looking good year round and for some of them to keep it healthy. And so that's the individual plant profiles and the styles. There is also some additional helpful lists including one that has all of the California native plants on it. Hedges and screens, for example, which will have some native plants that work as hedges. Uh, and then also plants for dry stream beds, infiltration basins, and swales. So this will include some of those plants that you could put right down in those flooded zones if you're setting up a dry stream bed to capture water. But most of the function of this website is under the plant finder where it's a multiple factor searchable database where you can say things like, I want a California native low water plant for full sun and I want it to be a perennial and I want it to attract butterflies and also be good for clay soils. And so then from the 350 plants we've had, uh, you can get to your main four. And there will be other plants you can research and find as well beyond that list if you want, but that's, that gives you some great quick sources. If you remove the butterfly requirements, that gets you up to nine. And for example, if you remove the clay soil requirements, now you're up to 15. But even for people with that heavy clay soil, plenty of plants to choose from. 
One other source that I want to show you, which is another great resource, is CalScape. It's a project of the California Native Plant Society. And this is a much more extensive in terms of the number of species database. It's a really great research tool for some first time gardeners or some gardeners just getting into native plants. It can be a little bit intimidating because it does give you a ton of information. One of the cool things that you can put in is just your zip code, 91767 for me, and it will tell you plants that, based on historical documents uh, and known ranges of plants, are likely to have been native to that location. So that'll give you 639 plants. But I will say, for the average gardener, a number of these plants are going to be really hard to find in nurseries. A number of them might be very tricky to grow at home because they really like to grow in wild situations. So what I encourage people to do is go to the advanced search because that will actually give you better information. And also, I do want to mention that native to your location is not always the main factor to look for. Uh, for example, for high summer, I really like to integrate a number of desert plants, sometimes desert plants like uh, like Palo Verdes, desert plants like the uh, desert willow. Those are nice medium-sized trees where locally we have shrubs and we have oak trees. And some of our shrubs can be pruned up some to small trees, but that's a, that's a nice niche to fill that you're not gonna find from a truly local native plant. And then another thing is that our, our native ecology, a lot of it other than the buckwheats are kind of quiet this time of year. And so by integrating a few more of those desert plants into an Inland Empire garden, uh, and we're not talking necessarily about cactuses, I'm talking about beautiful flowering shrubs, you'll have a lot more flowers in your garden for more of the year. So that being said, you can use your zip code or not, but for example, if you're going to use your zip code, also would inquire would would uh, encourage you to you can do the sun if you need to drainage based on your soil if you need to water, but you're going to want to look at for most beginning gardeners or people just getting into natives, you're going to want to click very easy for ease of care, and you're going to want to click commonly available for availability in nurseries, and with that you can search. And now from that 670 something for my zip code, now I'm down to 78 plants. And a lot of these plants will overlap with uh, the plants in the Inland Valley Garden Planner, but there's a lot of additional ones as well. And they also will have like annual wildflowers that you might want to grow from seed as well in areas in between your larger plants. So that is CalScape. And then each of these on CalScape does have a profile. It's kind of cool to see where the native range is, pictures, and then a lot of that same uh, information as well that you would find on the Inland Valley Garden Planner. They also have a lot of cool information about which wildlife it supports and specifically which butterflies or moths the leaves of the plant would be the larval food source of. So let's jump back into the main presentation. And a couple of other thoughts about choosing plants is we talked about this in the beginning as I was showing pictures of my yard right now. It's really a nice thing to tune into our seasons and understand that as part of the design. So for example, this California buckwheat and these rust color flowers are part of what's absolutely lovely about the plant, even though they're dried. Understanding that some plants that do dry out some in the summer, there's a whole range of subtleties of the golds to browns. And there's a lot of beauty in that. Or if you're someone who just is not going to find beauty in that, then be very careful that you're working with plants that are going to be evergreen and not go into that summer down period. I like to make sure that I provide a balance, often providing trees and a background that are going to be evergreen, uh, but then freely working with a combination of plants that will stay fresh looking year round, or at least have some plants that are at their peak in the summer, like the buckwheats, next to some plants that are not as much at their peak in the summer, like the sages that'll bloom a lot in the spring and then be a little bit more dried out. So trying to create that sense of balance. 
Native plants are mostly easy to grow, but require a bit of learning and a bit of a different approach. So looking at those maintenance guides on the Inland Valley Garden Planner will help you out with that. And with that, what we'll do now is answer some questions and then jump into a full example of the design process. And so questions from some of, for some of the earlier questions that came in uh, before our last break, I see a lot of very specific questions. So again, I'd be happy to get to all of those as we get to the end. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to look forward to see if there's questions about what we've been talking about recently. So from Gladys, can we mix native with some not natives like Mexican sage or geranium or other drought tolerant plants? Absolutely. What you're going to want to do is just take a look at their water requirements and mostly think about the pacing of how often you will be watering. So for a lot of our drought tolerant plants like the Mexican sage, like some of the Australian plants like kangaroo paws, most of the time to keep those looking good and flowering freely, people will be watering depending on their soils about twice a month in the summer. Sometimes people get away with less, but I consider that to be a general guideline. Some of our native plants, like I would say coffee berry, uh, like some of our perennials, like the margarita bot penstemon, the red buckwheat, our grasses are perfectly happy with that twice a month in the summer water. They might not need that much, but they're compatible. Whereas some of our other native plants, like white sage, like our, well, most of our ceanothus or manzanitas, that's going to be too much. So really looking at those irrigation schedules, the irrigation schedules on the Inland Valley Garden Planner could help. And just making sure that those specific plants will be compatible. Uh, from Lynn, how do we determine the best mature size of tree selection for a small front yard and a one-story house. Large ashes need to be removed and new trees installed. Uh, so you're going to want to look at two things. One of the things you're going to want to look at is the factors when you look at your research is the mature size of the tree. You're also going to want to look at the growth rate. So if the growth rate is very slow and you miss your shade, you might want to make sure that you work with a tree that is uh, more of a moderate growth rate. And so looking at those two factors and then going out and measuring your site and thinking about how far away from the house you want the branches to stay and then whether or not you are willing to work with tree trimmers. So sometimes you might go with a bigger tree knowing that it can be pruned some if you need to, but if you wanna stay away from that as much as possible, really making sure that the tree is perfectly suited for the size of the yard. And then another resource with trees that includes native and non-native trees that has some good information about those specific tree selection factors would be uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo has something called select tree, like as one word, S-E-L-E-C-T-R-E-E, -E -E, I believe. And so if you just Google uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and select tree, I'm sure that it will pull up. I don't remember the URL off the top of my head. I just kind of use Google each time I go to it, but it has some great information for tree selection. Uh, from Jenny, if you like more than one garden style, should you designate different areas in your yard for each type of garden style to allow less maintenance, or can you integrate the garden styles cohesively together? Great question. Uh, could be either answer depending on what you're looking for. Uh, and also looking at those plant factors is important. So for example, there is an area of my backyard that's more meadow, which to look its best requires more water than my other native zones, even though there's mostly native plants in that meadow. And so I have that meadow growing either where it gets the irrigation for my fruit trees or in an area that's a little, that's sunken, a little bit shadier, and that's the area that floods uh, when the water accumulates there. So those, for those kind of wetter meadow plants, uh, that's a separate area. In my front yard, however, our concept is the woodland, native woodland concept. However, for specific reasons that we'll look at in just a minute uh, in the design process, I wanted some specific plants that are really colorful and friendly to be along the outer edge for those cues to care. And so I did choose a few species that in terms of their sun, and their water requirements are 
not necessarily the logical choices to integrate into that woodland planting. They wouldn't necessarily be found in a woodland in the wild, but they are happy with the same amount of sun that that area gets, the same watering schedule. And I know that they're going to provide that pop of extra color that I want right around the edge. And so I mix those in. So it really depends on what you're interested in doing. And you can do either. There are really no rules. Just make sure that you're sticking with that. I would say maybe the only rule is put the right plant in the right place based on what's going to make it happy. So a couple of questions about specific situations that I will answer later. And from Sarah, where do I find out what type of mulch plants require? That is a great question. Sarah, I believe that we cover mulch later in this uh, talk. I think I have a slide that goes into exactly that but I do wanna make sure that it is in this talk. So please at the end, bring up that question again, if for some reason we don't cover that, but I think we will. And with that, uh, we have about an hour left. I think this is a great time to take our break. Let's take uh, say 10 minutes for a break. So uh, you know, get a cup of coffee, stretch your legs, uh, do whatever else you need to do. And we will meet back together at 11.10 and get going again. Okay, so right now we are going to go through an example of the design process. For those of you who have joined us for the Landscape Transformation Basics uh, class, we're gonna use the same overall example, but we're gonna have an opportunity to get much more into detail, have some new discussion around it as well. So I'm confident it will still be useful. So in the design process, first thing you're gonna to wanna to do before you get excited about individual plants, maybe if there's one that you know you want, that's, that's just fine, before you get too far, you want to evaluate your site and think about the plants and the features that you want to keep because there might be something there worth keeping. There might not be, but established trees, even if they're not low water trees, but if you have a, a beautiful 30 year old magnolia tree, maybe you wanna keep it. Maybe that's an area that you'll keep as a higher water zone right around that tree and mix it with California native plants that are maybe plants from like that meadow ecology or something that wants a little bit more water. And then maybe your other areas will be water wise. Uh, other factors, features you might wanna keep, whether it's paving or anything like that, uh, think about what you wanna keep. It doesn't need to be all or nothing with the California natives. Just make sure that if you're going to have plants that are old and have higher water, that you are somehow still providing for them, whether it's a separate zone in your irrigation system or just knowing you're gonna get out there with a smaller sprinkler, you know, an extra time a month to give it a deep water. With that in mind, you're going to want to set up a base plan. This can be pretty roughly drawn, doesn't need to be perfectly to scale, doesn't need to be on graph paper if you don't want it to be. If you're inclined to do that, uh, that's great. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But how I would normally start is just with a rough drawing. And what I'll often do is I'll pull up uh, my yard on Google Maps and just put it on the view where it's like the aerial satellite photo and zoom in some and then just freehand draw it. So on a piece of paper here, I did it on a tablet because I was going to be presenting it. It's easier to see the lines, but just getting it down somehow, however you want to do it. And normally what will happen is the first time I just draw it out, it's the scale is going to be to just totally off and I'll throw it away. And by the third or fourth time, I'm, I'm getting something pretty close. Another thing you can do if you want to is you could print out that, that Google Maps or Google Earth aerial and then use tracing paper and then just roughly trace the most important things to trace as long as you don't have a lot of trees blocking the views in that aerial photo. That's a, a pretty viable way to just get started. And so noting what are just gonna be the most important things in your case. We didn't have any existing trees or plants that we we're gonna be keeping to note. And so this house is on a cul-de-sac. And so here's the curve of the street, the driveway, neighbor's driveway, a gravel strip. Here's our main planting area. 
the walk to the house. Uh, where your water meter is, you wanna make sure that you're not gonna cover that up because the meter reader is gonna to need to get to it. And then locating any main utilities that might be uh, an issue. I like to generally know the path of the water main just to make sure I don't put a giant tree right on top of it. And normally that's between the meter and directly where you see uh, the hose bib and there's normally a shutoff valve going into your house. In this case, it was relevant because when the water main had been replaced, it was only put in like six inches deep, which is definitely not ideal. So also if you're digging a feature like a dry stream bed, yeah, you need to know where things are. And then what you should also do is call dig alert, which is 811 and you, they will send someone out within 72 hours, so do it ahead of time, just to mark and confirm that there are no buried utilities in the yard. And a lot of our older communities, like built in the 1950s or 60s, most of those will be in the street, but I've seen multiple cases uh, in some of the newer communities with smaller front yards where there's more buried utilities. So for example, uh, worked with a homeowner where their neighbor had the landscaper replace some shrubs and they took out the fiber optic internet line that was buried that went through the front yard and the neighborhood or a number of houses had no internet for quite a while and fiber optic lines are very uh, expensive and time consuming to replace. So you wanna protect yourself from all of that. Definitely make sure there's no buried gas lines that you need to worry about. And so that dig alert will will mark any of the utility side lines. And then you are going to be responsible for knowing or figuring out or proceeding with caution for anything after the, uh, the meter side. Uh, the gas company uh, can, I think, normally help you figure out where the gas line runs. They have marks. Uh, when I've had the gas company come out to check things when I was moving into my house, uh, they did identify for me uh, not down to the inches, but basically the, the main direction of where the gas line ran. So make sure you have that sort of stuff figured out. Additional things that I like to uh, have in always are where the windows in the house are for both front yard or backyard designs, but especially for the front yard, they're, they're pretty critical because for the way most people actually use their front yards, uh, oftentimes the backyard is the main social space. So front yard social spaces are great. If you have a big enough front yard, you're gonna set that up. But a lot of us, how we use our front yards is we see the yard as we drive up the driveway, as we walk into the house, but kind of on the weekends and the evenings, oftentimes the front yard is more experienced as the view out the windows. And so it's important how the yard looks from the street, but just as, if not sometimes more importantly, how we frame the views out of our windows, because that's going to also change the whole experience of living inside the house, depending on how your windows face the yard. And then I also like to note the ridges of the house, because we're going to talk about tracking where the rainwater goes, and that's going to set up some of that as well. So with that, I also always, always encourage people to come up with and actually write down, create a distinct list of your priority goals for the project and always have that nearby. Oh, sorry about that. Lost the screen share. Let's get back into that. What just happened there? Here we go. Oh, sorry about that. I inserted a blank slide somehow. So we're talking about goals. So with those goals, I encourage you to write it down, always have it nearby, not necessarily on that same exact piece of paper, but for the purposes of presenting that, that was useful. So my partner Kira and my goals for a front yard were to have it be beautiful to provide wildlife habitat. We wanted it to be low water. Privacy was also a significant goal of ours and the right balance of privacy because this is a relatively small front yard, not tiny, about 1200 square feet of planting area total. And we're on a cul-de-sac with similarly sized front yards. And the way things are set up from the windows, most of the windows facing out this way, especially the two rooms we use the most, which is over here, our living room. And on the right, I'm sitting at a desk at this window right now. There's about four different houses that all kind of point directly towards each house. Sitting in 
on our couch at this window, which is a large window, we look directly into the living room window of our neighbor across the street. And it's close enough that that's a little uncomfortable sometimes. And so we wanted to increase a sense of privacy, but without feeling like we are putting up just a huge hedge around the whole place and turning our back to the neighborhood, finding that right balance. We wanted it to smell great with those smells of the great California native plants. So we can experience that as we go up the driveway, as we're walking to and from the, uh, our cars through this section. And then also, even if we just had the screen door on a hot summer day. And then also in our neighborhood, we don't have a lot of street trees. That's not great. I wish there were more street trees. So we have that urban heat island effect in the summer, definitely. But because of that, we just happen to face north and have a great view of the mountains from all of these windows. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to provide that sense of privacy. We wanted to put in some small trees, but we wanted to make sure that we are going to align them to where we can frame and preserve some of the views of the mountains. And so that became our main uh, set of goals for this base plan. With that, you want to do your site analysis. And that's just kind of a fancy way of saying, get your observations down on paper. And so you're gonna to wanna to observe for as long as it takes and mark down where the sun is, where the shadier parts are, what parts are part shade, thinking about that throughout the year. So for example, on the north side of a building, you're gonna be shady a lot of the year, but full blasting sun in the summer. And that really reminds me, since the last time I presented this, uh, we have a new online uh, free resource that I'm going to type in where to download it from uh, into the chat right now. And that is, if you go to cbwcd.org slash native design guide, you can download a PDF that's a brief guide to California native garden design, but it does have a nice box on there talking about the different exposure areas, areas that face north, south, east, and west, and what they're going to mean as long as how to do a drainage test. And so basically what, what that's going to mean for you to sum it up very quickly, uh, to the north, directly next to the building, shady a lot of the year, but full blasting sun in the summer. And so there are some plants that can take that uh, transition, but you're gonna to wanna to do your research and make sure that those are plants that are adapted from full sun through shade. Fe areas facing west are going to be some of your hottest areas. East are going to be areas that you can have full sun, but then get a little bit protected from that afternoon extreme heat. And south are gonna be pretty hot areas as well if there's no shade. For soil and drainage, what you will want to do if you are unsure about whether or not you have well-drained soil is you're going to want to do a drainage test. A lot of native plants want what's called well-drained soil. If you don't have well-drained soil, whether it's through compaction or because you have naturally heavier clay soil, that's just fine. You're just going to want to make sure that you do the research and verify that your plants are adapted to clay soil. So that information would be on the Inland Valley Garden Planner. When you're searching for plants, you can check that clay soil box or on Calscape, it'll mention that the plants are adapted to clay soil or if they need well-draining soil as well. The quick for how to do a drainage test is dig a hole, or if, ideally if you're doing a, a larger size garden, two or three holes, about one foot deep, one foot wide, doesn't need to be perfect. Fill it with water from a hose at least once, if not twice, just to make sure that the water or the soil all the way around it is pretty well saturated because to test drainage, you need to be testing it in already wet soil. If the soil is dry, you're not gonna be getting good accurate results. Then finally, after that's happened, maybe you'll do that the day before, come back the next day, fill it with water and you want to time how fast it drains down getting an average of the number of inches per hour it drains down. Easiest way to do that is to lay something flat, whether it's like a broom handle, a yardstick, something like that across the top of it. And so then you have a good starting point marker, which then you could use a measuring tape or a ruler to measure down 
Uh, an easy way to do it is to do it every hour, uh, take your measurements of how much more the, the, the water level has dropped and then do an average after that. But we could do it whatever way, the timing of taking the measurements and the math is going to work for you. You definitely wanna do it for longer than the first hour because sometimes that rate can drop. Uh, but you figure out kind of in general what you're, what you're dealing with. And if your drainage is two inches per hour or more, you have well-drained soil and that's what you're looking for overall, that's ideal. If your drainage is more than four inches per hour, you might have a very, very well-drained soil. And most of our kind of shrubby, uh, chaparral, sage scrub, uh, kind of native plant will often do pretty well, but kind of getting into that moisture loving meadowy kind of stuff, if that's where you're going, you might want to add some compost to increase the water holding capacity. And then if you're between one and two inches per hour, that's moderate drainage. I have gotten away with planting a lot of plants and different projects that like well-drained soil and they've done well, but in some other projects, uh, when we've had a big series of storms in a rain year, some of those plants have sort of suffered. So it's kind of a proceed with caution. And if you wanna err on the side of caution, go with plants that are adapted to clay soil, less than one inch per hour, definitely you should be working with plants that are adapted to clay soil. There is no amount of additional work you can do uh, things you can add to your soil that will change those inherent properties of the soil. By working with a wood chip mulch over time, that can break down, that can bring some life to the soil and slowly loosen it. But if you have clay soil, you will never successfully like add enough sand to change the properties. Most of the time, you'll just make the soil more of a mess and harder to deal with. Also think about views, like my view of the mountains, if you have a view uh, down a canyon or something, or if your neighbor's uh, house looks down into your house, where water flows, hot and cold areas of those microclimates, there's noise or other issues, and then again, those existing plants. Talk to everyone who's going to be involved with the garden. Make sure all of your important stakeholders, whether it's your kids or your pets are addressed in some way and that you're taking things into account if it's more than just you enjoying that garden. Uh, kind of building uh, momentum for your project as well, especially if those other people are going to be expected to help maintain that space. Try to get them excited about it through bringing them in to this process. And then you're going to mark down your site analysis. And so then that can be pretty simple. Over this base plan, so if you're working on paper, after you have your base plan, don't ever draw on it again. In fact, scan it and make some photocopies in case you need to go back to it and then work with tracing paper over it. So you can make mistakes as you do your analysis and design. You can change things up. You can brainstorm and work on multiple design iterations and you'll never have to redraw that base plan. And so here, the things that were gonna be important to us would be the view of the mountains, the area that feels too open, where we have seasonal shade. And because of how this landscape was just naturally sat on the natural grade. Uh, the elevation drops, not extensively, but enough this way that water, water moves down from north to south. And water also comes off of the house in this direction. The eaves of the house are curved, so we couldn't easily, without extensive modification to the eaves, put in rain gutters. And so all of that water accumulates here and would flood. So that's important. We're gonna to wanna to solve that and turn that problem water into a resource in our garden. And that's the, the main uh, aspects of it. This whole zone was an area that had that seasonal shade because it faced north and this time of year, full blasting sun. So reflect back on that right plant, right place, match the plants to the soil and site conditions with sun and shade, size, soil type and drainage. Really take that size into account. One of the most common places where people go wrong is just either not extensively reading up enough about the plants or seeing that the plant's gonna get 10 feet wide and just not quite believe it, believing it. Planting the plants at their appropriate spacing away from each other is so vitally important to setting up yourself both for the look to be right, for your maintenance to be low over time, 
and for the plant health. Because if plants are too close together, you're going to have to do a lot of extra pruning. It's harder to keep the plant looking good. And some plants, if they're too overgrown, will start to have more disease issues with the lack of airflow. So really take that into account. Sometimes some of the nursery uh, containers, because those nurseries are selling plants all over the place, uh, say that things are a little bit smaller than they might actually get in our local inland valley gardens with the heat that we have for so much of the year. Some of our native plants just tend to grow a little bit bigger. So I encourage you to double check the size listings on the Inland Valley Garden Planner. I've done my best to make sure that as many of those listings as possible for the plants that do tend to get bigger than what the common like nursery tags would say, uh, that I have put the size and the width to be what my actual observations have been in local gardens if they're larger. And you can do your research for plants online. So we talked about Calscape in the Inland Valley Garden Planner. And then a couple of nursery websites that have really great information to check out as well are Tree of Life Nursery and Las Palitas Nursery. And the Theodore Payne Foundation also has an online database with some good information. And then visit local public gardens and nurseries that have native plants. And if you're slowly thinking about this and not going to be jumping into it right away, uh, take the chance to do that at different times of the year because certain plants in spring are going to look different than in summer. And so if you kind of do a, a spring, summer, winter, fall visit and take lots of pictures, you can really start to understand the pacing of some of these. So California Botanic Garden in Claremont is a great place to go. Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano has some beautiful demonstration plantings. Waterwise Community Center, which is us in Montclair. We are currently closed to the public, hope to be open soon. But we do have an area of native plants in our park that's open that has some examples of some of the, the toughest, easiest to grow, lowest maintenance uh, native plants. We put those out in the park and kind of minimally care for them just as a kind of uh, survival of the fittest research project. They do get water. We do do some annual pruning, but not a lot of work. And then the Theodore Payne Foundation in Sun Valley, which I think it just recently reopened uh, after being on limited opening because of COVID. You might want to check though. I'm not sure about how extensive or what hours the public has access to their demonstration plantings or if you need to make an appointment. You'll fall in love with a bunch of plants. This is the time to remind yourself to keep it relatively simple. Don't put in too many different plants and crowd them. Unless you're trying to have a botanist plant collection, you don't need 172 different plants. Average front yard, 10 to 15 different plants is usually more than enough. If it's larger and you have a couple of different areas, maybe 20, uh, but that's generally the most you would need for the average front yard. So going off of that, then I, I start to kind of just create a basic diagram, not a full planting design right away. That can come later, but just starting to figure out the different zones. So to meet those goals, for example, we decided we wanted to have an informal hedge here of nice habitat plants that would be evergreen for a nice backdrop throughout the year and would cut off some of the really open view, but maintain our view of the mountains above. On this corner, we would have a small deciduous tree that would be kind of low multi-branched. And so it would still be semi-permeable for a view. It's not like we're putting up just a wall turning our back to the neighborhood, but it obscures enough that it would not feel like we're looking directly into our neighbor's living room window from ours. And the leaves could come and go throughout the year, providing a little bit of variety of the view, both out and in throughout the year. And the alignment of this was designed to specifically be in line with a large tree farther out in the neighborhood where our mountain view was already blocked specifically in this direction. So preserving the main view that way. And then here would be a great area for a small evergreen tree, really providing us a little bit more privacy to this area and the way that the lots are set up as the wedge shape. Out of this window, we mostly see our driveway and then into the large asphalt area of the cul-de-sac. And so that evergreen tree here is going to be able to provide a much nicer view out of this window. And then from there, we also, talking about the cues to care concept, have these little C symbols. Those we know are gonna be pops of color. 
that we might go beyond that, that woodland plant palette to make sure we have plants that really provide quite a bit of color so that as this neighbor is driving into their driveway, instead of just the edge of our hedge, they get a little pop of color there. You know, the mailman coming up the driveway, a little bit of maybe enhanced uh, more color for the neighbors and people who come and go to look at along these edges. And then from there, we started really to think about how the garden is going to feel out of our main experience of this front yard, as long as we're not out there doing our maintenance, because we have a large backyard with all of our social spaces. Uh, on the daily basis, we mostly enjoy this garden by looking into it. So out of this window, out of the door when the screen is open, the nice weather, uh, out of this window where I sit at the desk and work quite a bit. And then our cats hang out a lot in this room. This has a really big window, so their view out here. And so with that, we decided on a few things. We wanted to start with lower plants and then kind of build them up to provide an increased sense of depth in this area. And so starting with kind of low perennial plants that can take the sun and the shade. We knew that we had room for a couple of shrubs to help frame these windows without blocking the view, kind of a foundation plantings and taller plantings just up against the stucco, and then a ground cover of lower plants building out into what would be a meadowish effect with a bird bath that could be seen from both these windows. And then from there, we could have a medium layer of accent shrubs and then building up to the trees or taller hedge providing as many layers as we can to build that sense of depth. After we're settled on that for the concept, and then also implementing something called a French drain, which it works well in an area where we don't really have the width to do a dry stream bed. Essentially, that's a trench that's filled with the coarse gravel, mixing in some additional cobble to make it look a little bit more natural, and the water can flow through that gravel-filled trench in between the pore spaces of the gravel which would bring it out from the flooded area around to the side. And then a large storm event, this actually then feeds the dry stream bed into that sunken meadow all the way around the backyard, all with just uh, gravity. So no pumps, no pipes really to get clogged except for just a small wide pipe underneath this walkway. From there, we start to refine it just a little bit more not necessarily placing individual plants, but starting to define our plant list for what would happen in each zone. So deciding on our two main species for the hedge, holly leaf cherry and California coffee berry. For the main trees, right, make your decisions for those. So these are two large native shrubs that can be pruned up and will be pruned up with their lower branches coming off over time to be more like small trees. Western red bud for the deciduous one, toy on for the evergreen one, all of these great habitat plants as well. We decided that yarrow would be our main meadow species. And then along the edge, so we would have a walkway that where we could walk out from our front walk, across from our front door into this area. Yarrow can take some tra foot traffic. It's not something you'd want to stomp on or be playing on every day, but for also getting through here and doing our maintenance, it'd be just fine to walk over. So it does nice as double duty. Since we're not going to be walking through here, even on a daily basis, I didn't want it just to be a like mulch path, but it's something that we can easily walk on to then get to other areas of the garden. And then mixing in some grasses and some colorful natives, verbena, penstemons, native strawberry in the shadier spots, California native currants up against the house where they can take the shade to the sun, and then starting to realize that we have a little bit more room than just the three shrubs that I had roughly drawn out. So figuring out that it would be a mixture of sage, uh, native deer grass, manzanita, a fragrant pitcher sage, so some of our favorite smelling plants with the sages and the pitcher sage, and you'll see pictures of all of these in just a little bit. And then for our colorful west edge and our little spot over there, we'd be working with penstemon, verbena, red buckwheat, and hummingbird sage. If you are interested in then taking this and drawing it all up, what's called to scale on graph paper, where every little square is the equivalent of a certain size in the real world, I encourage you to do so. Some people that's just totally unappealing to, and you're never gonna do that. So I'm not gonna tell you, you have to do it, but if you are at all up for it, even if it's a challenge to take the measurements and do that, 
I would highly encourage you. It will really help you be able to refine your final planting plan and shop with confidence at the nursery to know you're buying the right number of plants. If you're just not gonna do that, you can keep things pretty conceptual, kind of guess as to the numbers. Something I'm, I like to do if we're not going to draw it all out is to get some of those inexpensive uh, irrigation flags from the landscape supply store where it's kind of just a wire uh, stake with a small wire and then the colorful plastic flags. And for your main things like your trees, the spacing of your hedge plants where the numbers are really important to get right, you can stick those into the ground and kind of take measurements uh, against what the full size will be and label them out to figure out your plant list. Even if you just want to feel it out, it might require more trips to the nursery because you might uh, not buy quite enough plants, need to kind of rearrange things. But that is some, a way that you can do it. I'm not going to tell you you have to draw things out to scale, but if it at all is something you think you can take on, I would encourage you to do it. My favorite resource that I've seen right now for how to do that process is a book that was put out, created by a company called G3 that does a lot of education for sustainable gardens and funded by the LA Department of Water and Power. And you can get that for free. It's online as a, as a free download. And I set up a quick link to get you there at cbwcd.org slash G3 book. And so starting on page eight, they go over drawing out a site plan working with how you figure out where you might want to capture the rain, put in something like a dry stream bed or an infiltration basin, and then moving on to drawing out your planting plan. One thing I do want to mention is that uh, this is kind of assuming more of a urban rather than suburban area scale for the graph paper, where this mentions using each one fourth of an inch being one foot what I find in our service area, kind of inland empire or more suburban gardens is that the yards tend to be a little bit bigger than works for that scale. So for a full front yard or a full backyard, I encourage you to buy 11 by 17 size paper for your graph paper. Uh, you can, I think often you can get that at uh, like art supply store, even like Michael's, it's easy to order online. And the standard for graph paper will be one fourth of an inch equals one foot. Sometimes you can get it where within that there's a smaller grid that's one eighth of an inch equals one foot. If you can get that at 11 by 17, I'd encourage you to do that. If not, the one fourth inch will be fine. And so what I find is that having your scale be one eighth of an inch equals one foot for the average size kind of suburban full front or full backyard generally uh, is going to be the most common kind of go-to scale. And so if you're doing that one eighth of an inch equals one foot, that's still something you can measure out pretty easy with a ruler. If your graph grid paper, you can get the smaller grids, then you can get that one eighth inch grid. Each little square is gonna be one foot. If you're working with that one fourth inch graph, graph paper, then you just know that each little square is two feet in each direction. And so that's that guide. And so with that, you can go from this and then, so this is the final planting plan for the front yard. I do a lot of this stuff. So I use a computer program. Uh, it's no better or no worse than if you drew it out yourself. It's just a little faster because you can set up each of the, the circles and uh, move them around and rearrange things. But the learning curve for these programs is pretty steep. So if you're just doing it for your yard, most people are better off uh, hand sketching. What you can do to help you out with the circles is online easily. And at most art supply stores, you can get a circle template is what they're called, which is a flat piece of plastic where circles of different sizes. And you want to make sure you get one in inches, not centimeters. And so what that will have is, so for example, if you're using that one eighth inch scale, they will have circles that would go all the way from usually one eighth inch wide, which would be a one foot plant to two inches wide, which would be a 16 foot plant. So you can have those circles and that can help you draw out things to the right size a lot easier than trying to freehand draw each of them. And this is just an abstraction because plants don't all usually grow in perfect circles, but it really helps you figure out your basic spacing. And so you can see how this then converts those concepts to the real world. So figuring out our exact numbers for our cherries, our coffee berries, for our habitat hedge, 
our grasses with the perennials in between, our colorful swath on the side, and helps us figure out the number of plants we want to get for our yarrow meadow. And so this is the house when we got it. We moved in in about October, so we missed the ideal planting season because we then had to do as much as we could to kill the lawn beyond the ideal season with which to kill the lawn. And this was it in January when we were really starting to plant things out. And so we did plant at the very, very end of what I would consider an appropriate planting season for a native garden, unless you have absolutely no other alternative. I uh, just did not want to wait and knew that we would do the extra work to make sure we were paying attention to and caring for our plants through that first hot summer because I was not wanting to leave my lawn brown and be the new person who moves into the neighborhood and just has the dead lawn for a year, but also did not want to be the water conservation person wasting a bunch of water on a lawn I didn't use. And so this is our plant layout. Uh, and the green here is not living lawn. These are some annual weedy grasses that we knew that through the sheet mulching technique we would use, we could take care of. And so this is our plant layout for that scale. As you are working with things, it's important to also kind of picture things growing in, design with your body, walk through the space. Does it feel, especially for your pathway areas, like it's gonna be comfortable to get through? Are things wide enough for your access? And then use your mind's eye to, to the extent you can. Picture things growing in. Maybe have someone stand where your main trees are gonna be and put their arms, at, arms out like branches. Sounds kind of silly, but I do that all the time and it could help really being able to picture it. And then sometimes you might tell someone, you know, take a step to the right, take another step to the right, take a step forward. And you might adjust where you're going to put things a little bit, nudge things here and there. I almost always end up doing that because even with the most careful planning on paper, once you start laying out all of these plants, you really start to see how things align with everything that's around it. And so here's Kira getting started on the planting. Here's our trench dug without being filled with gravel yet for that French drain that's gonna come through this area. And here it is in March, 2019, right after planting. This is where most people say, there is no way I planted enough plants. This is never gonna grow in. This does not look like anything. Here is our mulch. This is also mulch for a large backyard. So you don't need this much just for a front yard of that size and our cardboard boxes that we had accumulated. And now we start putting down cardboard boxes and wetting them down before we cover it with mulch to be our temporary biodegradable weed barrier. Last six months to nine months, maybe a year, depending on the moisture level. And uh, then by the time it just breaks down and literally will just disappear into the soil, most of the weeds underneath will be smothered. Because this was a mostly Bermuda grass lawn ahead of time, there it will be some Bermuda grass that comes back. It's just tough and tenacious. And so there's no 100%, uh, no matter what you do, whether it's herbicides or smothering it or whatever, there's no 100% way to kill all of it at your first go. And so you just need to be on alert. So for us with that Bermuda grass uh, first year, I was out there every weekend uh, just checking for it. And oftentimes it was no more than five minutes spent pulling things, but just staying on top of it. Because if you turn your back with that Bermuda grass that comes back, it will take over eventually and it will be all intertwined with the roots of your new plants. Then by later on in that season, uh, maybe it was every other week. And then this year being a little bit later, uh, year and a half on, it is maybe once a month. I will admit that I got a little bit behind on it uh, in the last little bit of time because it's been super hot. I've been focused on keeping things alive in the backyard and the vegetable garden, uh, harvesting the vegetable garden. And it's been disgusting outside lately because of the fire. But yesterday morning, I spent uh, maybe an hour out there, got most of the way caught up with all the weeds in the front yard. So it's still very periodic. And part of that reason is because I'm surrounded by Bermuda grass lawns that sometimes go to seed my neighbor's houses. So a lot less maintenance overall than if it was a lawn. I mean, like night and day, get a lot more out of it, but there will be some maintenance. I'm not gonna promise that it's gonna be maintenance free. And so this is March, moving forward to May, 
So things starting to grow, but you can see this is that red bud tree just planted from a one gallon plant. The vast majority of plants, there's no reason to plant anything other than one gallon. Sometimes the trees you might put in, you can only find in five or occasionally 15 gallons. So that's fine for a tree, but don't bother uh, spending your money in the vast majority of cases on five gallon uh, shrubs or definitely perennials. A couple of years out, usually even a year out, your one gallon plants, if they grow well, will be the same size. And the five gallons are a lot more expensive and they're harder to plant well as well. They're heavier, they take up more space in the car. So most of the time you're gonna to wanna to plant small. So this is about two and a half months. So a lot of mulch, you can think, see things starting to grow in. See our, we still have more work to do, but starting to mix some different size stones, mostly as we just dug them out from our backyard because we had enough rock in our backyard that we were digging up as we were starting to build the dry stream bed in the backyard that we didn't need to buy anything. And plants starting to grow at different paces, a uh, little bit of color. And then August of that year, at about five months, just caught a glimpse out the screen and realized we see mostly plants other than mulch. I still had a lot of growing to do, but starting to see a little bit of the design. So there's the red bud, here's those pops of color along the edge. California fuchsia starting to bloom later in the summer, attracting hummingbirds, showing that we're providing habitat for native leafcutter bees, which don't sting people. The native bees really don't sting people unless you're trying to crush them in between your hands. They're just not aggressive, uh, but they like to eat the leaves of thin uh, plants. They love Western red bud, and then they'll use that to build their nests. See the one area of our French drain where we had a little bit more room, kind of did a little bit more of a dry stream bed kind of thing. And then we'd start having our local residents. And so, uh, for example, with this native California fescue plant, we had a hummingbird that would spend every morning waiting here and then flying around and either chasing hummingbirds away from the hummingbird feeder or trying to uh, pick little bugs and gnats and things out of the air in the garden. So things starting to grow in. You always lose one or two plants. Here's an area along our driveway. So again, that hot Western exposed asphalt reflected heat and red buckwheat normally does pretty well in the sun. Uh, but the first year we lost one. And then this year we lost another one in that same grouping of three. So I'm not gonna replace that. I think it's just a little too hot of a microclimate. So you're always learning something new in a new garden. This is it at approximately six months, the coffee berry hedge starting to grow in. So things really do get going, not all at the same pace. So our manzanita, which will be one of the most beautiful accent plants uh, long term and one of the most long, longer lived plants, hopefully, in our garden. This is sunset manzanita. It takes a while to get going, but the color on that new growth is just gorgeous. You can see uh, salvia towards the end of its bloom. This is Alan Chickering sage which attracts a ton of hummingbirds. And then as it dries out, brings in the gold finches for the seeds. So we got another load of mulch that I'm standing on top of to take this picture at about 13 months. So this is the spring of this year with lots of color from the penstemons, from our native Delamina verbena. So we have butterflies, hummingbirds. That's the early spring. We have hummingbird sage here. And then the buckwheats come later in the summer. And really starting to enjoy the juxtaposition of the different textures, especially the grasses. I really like combining deer grass and then leaving little spaces in between the deer grass for showy penstemon, which is taller, and then it gets cut back hard. And so it just kind of disappears when it's cut back and then rises up in between the grasses at different times of the year. It's one of my very favorite plant combinations for working with native plants. The hummingbirds love the penstemon flowers and the goldfinches love the seeds from the deer grass. And you can see here the hedge continuing to grow in and not in bloom, but here's the buckwheats for that little pop of color later in the season at the, the edge of the neighbor's driveway. Coffee berry is really one of those ones that looks great year round. So it's also a great one to have near the edge for the neighbors. Uh, because it's just a, it's a, a plant that's just always pretty stable. Uh, this is fragrant pitcher sage, absolutely beautiful in the spring with the fuzziness. It's just impossible to cap 
capture how it captures the light of the camera. Smells amazing, attracts hummingbirds. And so this is the view out from the room that our cats mostly spend time in. So they have a great view out into the action in the garden. So we do prefer a very naturalistic, somewhat uh, chaotic look. And that's just uh, what I love. It looks natural to me. And I feel like I could use a little bit more wildness in my life. And the new growth on the sunset manzanita. Margarita bought penstemon. This is Yerba Buena, which is in one of the shadier areas and is a mint relative that smells great. You can use it for tea, a little ground cover. Some hookras in the areas that stay shady through a lot of the year. They look great in the spring. We intentionally put them. They are one of the plants that do really look kind of rough with any amount of direct sun in the summer inland. Uh, they're best in dappled shade. But this is my favorite. This is Island Alum Root or Hucra Maxima. I just love these flowers. They're so beautiful in the spring and they start blooming pretty early in the spring. And so we have just a few of them here where this time of year, we know they're gonna look fried, but we're okay with that because they'll recover over the winter and they'll look amazing again in the spring. So doing the research so you can make those informed choices. And then beyond it, you can see that kind of green carpet of the yarrow. And so, working intentionally with doing the research and the pacing of when things are going to bloom. And so the idea is you have kind of a cascade of blooms throughout the season. So in spring, you can see what we have here, that hookra, the penstemons, the, the humming, or sorry, the fragrant pitcher sage, and then the yarrow hasn't started yet. But by the time these start to fade, the Margarita bot penstemons keep going for a very long time, but by the time a lot of this other stuff starts to fade, then the next wave of flowers start. And so you can see that the yarrow comes in. This is coyote mint here, which is another little perennial that does well in the part shade a lot of the year and then can take more sun later in the year. So it's a whole other cast of characters that comes in. Uh, the hummingbird sage is done, but I'll leave the flower stems for quite a while longer because I think these are ornamental in the garden still and I let the seeds develop. And then you can see the Allen chickering sage in the background also coming in a little bit later. And then to be totally honest, I want to include some pictures that I just took yesterday because no garden looks 100% uh, year round unless maybe you have a lawn that you fertilize a lot and water a ton. And so what these gardens do is they embrace the seasons. And so in September, after a record heat wave, it's going to still be beautiful, but things are a little bit uh, not at their peak. And so most of the time when people teach classes or talk about gardening or have books, they only show those peak springtime photos and it's not realistic. And so people will put the gardens in at home and then wonder why their garden doesn't look that good year round. But there's a couple of things to know about that. The first one, is that in those books and magazines, there's always some sort of plant dying in those gardens as well. The photographer just doesn't take a picture of those things. They frame the photograph to only get the best parts. Additionally, most of those gardens, it's known like what week or a couple of weeks of the year it's gonna look the best. And that's when they schedule the photographs. None of those gardens look that way year round. And so this is after the record heat wave, you can see we have one plant, our verbena is looking kind of rough. I think it'll come back in the fall. Our penstemons are mostly done flowering. And if we wanted to clean up that look, we could do some cutting back now. But overall, I think it's still a handsome landscape, especially if you tune into those different colors of browns and tans. That's a large part of enjoying the California summer. Our hedge that's starting to grow in is still a beautiful dark evergreen. And so as it grows in more in our toy on, that'll have that look that stays consistent throughout the year. We have our dwarf, uh, Oregon grape on the side as well, which stays looking the same year round and a pretty nice looking blue of a called Canyon Prince wild rye. Our yarrow, uh, in the heat waves, what I like to do is, even though I'm still only watering once a month, I think to water right before the heat wave, which is always what you want to do, get your deep water again, 
before the heat wave, never during the middle of the heat wave. We'll talk about that in our future installation and establishment class. And then in between, when I don't want to water everything else, I'll just get out there with the hose and water the yarrow a little bit more to keep it looking fresher. It'll survive without that water, but it'll look better with a little bit more sometimes during the really high heat. California coffee berry, you see here with some of the ashes on it, but still looking nice as a plant. Holly leaf cherry being the other plant in the shrub. And then this is a Baja plant, another one that doesn't fit the theme of this area, but is just a great plant. And this was the best place we had for it in full flower. This is the window that I'm sitting at right now on the inside. And I watch hummingbirds come and go to this plant all throughout the day. Sunset manzanita having grown some, starting to see that beautiful peeling red bark. And so overall, pretty handsome. Just wanted to mention a few of those summer stars that look great year round. We have more of them in our backyard. California buckwheat, Blissianum buckwheat, hybrid, Palmer's mallow, desert plant on the right. And then in bloom now, California goldenrod, burgundy desert willow. And so since we're towards the very end, I'm gonna hold questions and just cover uh, the last few sorts of things that I really want to get through, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So a note on mulches, we had that question earlier. So mulch is a term for anything that goes on the top of the soil. In general, you want to put something on the top of the soil other than soil to help keep the weeds down and to help insulate the soil and keep it from being hot to keep the temperature down in the soil, especially if you're watering your native garden at all. And most of us are going to water water, want to water about once a month after things are established, keeps things looking a little fresher, keeps things looking a little bit better in our gardens, not being as dry as they would be in the local hills, and also keeps things less fire prone because there's more moisture in the plants. If you have a woodland plant palette, you're going to want to start with wood chips and then eventually the the natural leaf droppings from those woodland plants are going to be good. In general, for chaparral or desert kind of plants, your shrubby kind of things, full sun stuff, the closest match for what they would naturally be growing in would be to mulch with a couple of inches of either gravel or decomposed granite. But oftentimes, uh, we don't want to start our gardens with that wall-to-wall -wall gravel because that would feel really hot and create a lot of reflected heat at the beginning. It's also a lot of materials to buy in. So often what I'll do for a mixed native landscape or those plants that really would grow naturally in that kind of more gravelly or decomposed granite kind of material, the stuff from the local foothills, what I'll do is on planting, I will just once mulch the whole garden with wood chips, you know, two inches of wood chips or so. And that's to insulate the soil, to keep the temperatures down and just kind of hold the space until the plants get going. And then if you're working with the kinds of planting designs that we've been talking about where things grow into a pretty full state and there's not huge gaps in between the plants, then as those plants grow in, you're not gonna need to mulch them anymore because just the natural turnover of the leaves, even if they're an evergreen plant with just some of them uh, dying and dropping over time to be replaced by new ones, they're gonna become self-mulching and that's the best mulch for them. And then what I'll sometimes do is little bits at a time as I have it, I'll go back and aesthetically just kind of mix in a little bit of gravel. Most of this is stuff that I've dug up from my yard in this picture. Sometimes I'll buy it and if I need to mix in some here, there, a branch, a piece of bark or whatever, just to kind of create a naturalistic look so it's not all wood chips. And so it'll be a combination of different things, which is very similar if you remember to a lot of those pictures that I showed from that walk in the wild, where even though it didn't start with actual wood chips, it's years of accumulated leaves, some broken down pieces of dropped branches, uh, some rocks and gravels as well. So I, I'm a fan of that kind of naturalistic look. And even sometimes I'll be like out hiking and I'll see an area where it all comes together really nicely. I'll take some pictures to remember as maybe something to emulate back at home. And then our last section where we're just gonna really introduce basics is design for habitat. And so again, there's a whole full class about design for habitat, and we will get into individual plants and things that those individual plants are good for, who they support. 
And then another thing to note is since we focused this class mostly on the design principles, which are more important than me saying this plant is cool for this, this plant is great for that, because with those principles, you can do your research and apply that yourself. We do have another class online called Favorite Plants for Inland Valley Gardens, which is the class that covers mostly native plants, a few plants that aren't natives that are adapted to Southern California really nicely as well. And in that favorite plants for Southern California gardens or for Inland Valley Gardens talk, that is the class where I go through and talk at plant by plant one at a time, plants that are good for, you know, full blasting sun with reflected heat, plants that are good for the north side of a house where it has that shady and then blasting sun, you know, my favorite patio sized trees, uh, other things like that. And most of those plants covered are native plants. So I encourage you to check that out if you're looking for that. So most important things of design for habitat. First one is in Southern California, we are still actively losing habitat, developing in areas with habitat. And with our extreme weather situation that we've had the last number of years and will continue to have, uh, things are pretty dicey. And there are a number of things we can do in our gardens related to habitat. What we do won't change the world on an individual plot, but it is something that we can do that does contribute. And so if you read in the news about what's happening on the large scale or just the local scale, uh, it's, it is a positive action we can take. And if you design for habitat, if you plant the native plants, you will see the proof things will show up, things will live in your garden, things will visit your garden every year and then migrate elsewhere and come back. We can create habitat right in our yards to host things long-term. So like I have some residents, I have a mockingbird who lives in my yard most of the year. Uh, we have goldfinches who live in our, our oak tree a lot of the year. And then other things will just sort of stop by on their way in between other places. So they're gonna be migratory but you will be somewhere in between two wider natural places. So in our local area, uh, most of the service area of the Waterwise Community Center is in between the San Gabriel Mountains to the north and Chino Hill State Park and Prado Basin to the south and then on to more natural areas in Orange County. And so what we do in our yards provide stopover spaces for birds, insects that might be migrating along the way. Uh, we also, the last couple of years, have had great migrations going from east to west through our area of sister butterflies in the spring. My yard, every year that they come through for those few weeks, is a stopover. And so many of them congregate in my yard to get nectar plants of what they need here and there as they go. And the more native gardens that they have the opportunity to stop through on their way through, the more successful that they can be in their migrations. So what we need to do to provide things is food, water, and shelter. You can think about who you want to invite into your garden specifically. For example, you're choosing songbirds and then look up and provide for their needs. And there's a couple of different approaches. There are generalist species of whether it's butterflies or birds and they're specialists. So if you want to, you can target certain species that you like, for example, monarch butterflies need milkweeds and provide for their needs. But there are also a lot of generalists or specialists that you will just naturally capture their needs if you plan for a variety of native plants that bloom throughout the year. When your plants flower and the flowers fade, the traditional garden approach is deadheading. As soon as the flowers fade, you cut, cut, them, cut them back but that will never develop seed for our songbirds. So what I encourage people to do is don't cut off the seed heads too soon, let them ripen and develop to where they're dried out. And then when you do cut them back, you might cut up the, the parts that you cut off the seed heads in the garden and leave them in the mulch layer because certain birds like the goldfinches will prefer to get the seeds off of the branches when they're there. And then once they're part of the mulch layer, you'll get birds like the doves and the towhees that their natural habit is to scavenge off the ground. And most of those birds, they won't transition to do the other things in a lot of cases. And then provide some source of water, bird bath, a recirculating water feature, or ideally both. You can get certified as a wildlife habitat if you're interested through the National Wildlife Federation. 
That's a cool little program and it gives you a sign that you could put in your front yard. Another one of those cues to care, explain to people that you are providing food, water, cover, and places to raise young. Realistically in our suburbs, that's mostly gonna be for birds and lizards and pollinators and butterflies. So you provide food by doing that research, those plants, water, Can be very simple. That's my favorite water feature that we've moved from place to place. It's an old uh, horse water trough that we acquired that wasn't being used, got it for free, but you can buy them even at Home Depot these days. I've seen them fill it with water. And then we put some aquatic plants in plastic pots on top of milk crates and a simple, it was like a $30 recirculating uh, little fountain pump and provides a lot of habitat. Also use a lot of saucers that glazed ceramic is great, easy to clean out instead of buying expensive bird baths. This is a small one that we put up on a cinder block to raise it up some to make the birds uh, happier. Birds like things to be raised off the ground some, makes them safer from cats in the neighborhood. And then we just use some small pieces of broken concrete around it to hide the cinder block or recirculating water features. That could be a little bit fancier over, spilling over the side of the pot and then going into an underground vault buried under the gravel to recirculate. For the native pollinators, a lot of them nest in bare soil in the ground. So a patch or two of bare soil, even if you're mulching, is really important to have. And a few piles of rocks for the lizards to live in. If you're not in a fire zone, it's really great to have a few logs or larger branches as well. They provide great habitat to a whole host of other native pollinators that will burrow into the, the wood and make their nests there. Because this is a water-wise garden with artificial turf, a couple of sago palms, and just a few other plants, but it doesn't provide anything else, I don't think, other than being low water. It's not a beautiful place to be, in my opinion. Uh, it doesn't provide for wildlife at all, and it's not really an inhabitable space, especially in the summer, the artificial turf gets really hot. Whereas a garden like this is a little rambunctious, may or may not be your style. You can have your style be anything that you want, but it provides shelter. It provides constant uh, change. It provides a lot of interest for the homeowners. And this was a homeowner designed and installed garden where they can learn, make changes over time and really changes the experience of this relatively small front yard. And so with that, just a few more slides checking out butterfly habitat with narrow leaf milkweed, some things like penstemons that provide nectar, or other specific plants. Like we like to grow a plant that a lot of people think is kind, is kind of weedy looking. I think it looks interesting, but it's the native plantain. But this is the one of the few plants that this beautiful buckeye butterfly can raise its caterpillars on. So we have this plant next to our water feature. It reseeds itself some, easy to grow. And then uh, that's great. So looking up about specifically, or looking at our other workshop, you know, what sort of plants host or provide for which uh, animals or wildlife. So this is just an example for manzanita. It's one of the few plants that comes into bloom in the winter and butterflies and hummingbirds use it as a very important seasonal nectar source. And with that, just a few pictures of some pollinator habitat working with annual wildflowers and lawn blooming perennials like yarrow and bird habitat. With bird habitat, it's not just the food sources, it's also having some dense shrubs and some trees for branching and cover and protection and places for them to perch. So this is right outside the window where I am now, where our tohi will come and perch on this branch that we just put into the ground, sticking up. So it gets a nice view to hunt insects over the garden and then lands right in front of me to eat them sometimes. And with lizards, a couple of rocks is all you need. And then all sorts of other wildlife will probably show up like this praying mantis pod. And then to conclude, don't forget the human habitat because our gardens will seem easier to care for if they're comfortable spaces we enjoy spending time in. Doesn't need to be expensive. This is 
80 to maybe $100 worth of one gallon plants. Definitely looks to me like it's probably homeowner designed, uh, but changes this house, which is on a relatively busy street, provides a lot more, provides shade, wildlife, uh, some shelter for the house, makes it feel set farther back, smells good compared to the lawn it probably replaced. Not too many plants, often better to keep it simple and don't be afraid to start super simple. So not necessarily what I would do, but I would much rather see rather than just a parched dead lawn, few native plants starting to show up to provide a little bit more for the neighborhood and the habitat. So final thoughts and advice. And I realize we've gone over the time that we're planning. Thank you very much for staying with us. There's just so much to share with you, but this is the final series of slides and then we will answer all of our questions and I'll ask you to do the final poll really quickly. Final thoughts and advice. Remember your goals, focus on your goals and your concepts. Those are gonna be your filter to help you avoid having 172 random different plants. Keep it simple. Most front yards tend to maybe 20 different types of plants in most cases, 10 to 15, it's probably all you need. Focus on right plant, right place, match your sun size and soil conditions. Think about how much time you want to spend working in your garden. Stick with your concept, not a bunch of random plants. Remember that cues to care concept. If you're thinking about front yards and what the neighbors will think, if that's important to you. You're gonna to need to understand your irrigation and test it periodically. So come to our irrigation classes, I especially encourage you if you're taking out a lawn to come to our class coming up in October. We already have on our YouTube channel, some other classes about irrigation. Do a bit of research. And instead of thinking about having to get up there and do maintenance, think about care and caring for your garden. And your garden will also help care for you, provide therapy from the stresses of life, a lot of the work can be done in the morning with a cup of coffee or enjoying your garden in the evening out with your pruners and a glass of wine with then more intensive bouts of maintenance in the fall and the spring. It can help you out to chart your plants and make a care calendar for you or your gardener. Look to nature for inspiration. And if things aren't all going perfectly or you're losing a couple of plants, try to have nature's patience as well. It doesn't happen overnight. As long as you're learning from each thing and thinking about, you know, what should I do next as I am the person interacting with and managing this ecosystem that I sent to motion, there are a few true mistakes in the garden. Learn from those experiences and then it becomes an interesting process instead of just frustrating. The garden is never truly done, but remember to enjoy it. So with that, here are some of the top local plant sources and some of the links for the information. What I'm going to do is I'm going to launch our concluding poll, which just has some evaluation questions and some other questions for us to know what you might be interested in in the future. We really like to hear feedback as well. In the comments, please feel free and I encourage you to leave any other comments uh, that wouldn't be captured in the closing poll. We're still relatively new to teaching online workshops. We're used to teaching workshops in person, so we want to make sure this information is working for you or if there's any other topics that you would be interested in, let us know. If there's things that didn't work, uh, we are perfectly happy to hear what didn't work for you or anything on the more critical side as well. We definitely take that all into account as we try to do the best job we can to help all of you out. And so with that, what I am going to do is I am going to jump into answering more questions starting with the ones that have come in since our last question break, and then I will go back as well. So first question is from Jenny. What options are there for a walking path on a very steep inclining slope in a backyard? Good question. So what you don't want to do on a steep slope is decompose granite because that will absolutely run off and you don't want to do gravel because that can be slippery on a very deep slope. What I would tend to do is probably use, uh, if, if it is a slope that can be mulched, I would probably use a wood chip mulch 
And if it is a very, very steep slope, you might stick with something called Gorilla Hair Mulch, which is a shredded cedar bark. Normally, it's not what I would prefer for general wide areas, but it does mat together in a specific way that tends to have it hold on slopes a little bit better and be a little bit more resilient to winds. So maybe just for those path areas, uh, that would be an option. Or if it's extremely steep, you might need to do something where you would put in uh, pavers or steps and make sure that those are installed well in whatever way you might need to with little uh, retaining areas. And then with that, if necessary, a handrail or a cable or something like that. Uh, so can I suggest a California native plant that will do well in the shade for nine months out of the year, but can tolerate full extreme heat in the summer? So that's that northern exposure. Uh, for smaller plants, uh, yarrow is a go-to plant of mine for that sort of situation that does very well. For shrubs, uh, California coffee berry would be one of my go-to uh, plants. For larger shrubs, toyon would be a go-to for that. And then if you're interested in more ideas in that uh, favorite plants for Inland Valley landscapes, we have a whole section where we talk about that. And additionally, when I post the slides of this workshop on the cbwcd.org slash presentations, what I will include at the end of this are some slides of my favorite native plants organized. And there is a small section for that facing north kind of situation, which is usually where that occurs. So from Lynn, does yarrow as a mowed lawn substitute need overhead spray or each plants on so point, source point drip? Definitely overhead spray for that, uh, not each plant on point source drip. And in general, for native plants, you want to avoid having each plant on point source drip because they want to spread their roots far and wide and point source drip tends to concentrate all of the water right at the base. Drip irrigation is possible, but what I encourage is a drip grid system if you're going to use drip with native plants. And to learn more about that, you can check out our online drip irrigation class that will go into that and also talks about some of the reasons why we don't recommend point source drip. And then also, uh, if you want to learn how to convert that lawn area to that drip kind of grid, you can join us for the workshop next month. There's a, quite a bit about setting up drip grids in that drip irrigation workshop as well. Uh, I got a lot of pine needles on my front yard. Is the acidity from the needles an issue with natives? I don't believe in most cases you're going to be accumulating that much acidity where it would be, but the main thing you're going to want to think about is selecting plants that will look okay with needles falling on them or that you can clean the needles off of. So a lot of times I like to work with bunch grasses if there's going to be needles that are falling. So like a deer grass would be a common one that a lot of the needles will just kind of fall in between the blades of the grass and then you can pretty easily actually even get in there with like a leaf rake and rake the needles out periodically if you need to whereas some shrubs uh, that are more of a traditional small shrub shape they kind of have the needles just start to pile up on top of them and it can be a lot of maintenance so ground covers like yarrow that can take the raking bunch grasses in that main needle drop zone are are good kind of go-to's About how much was the budget for the plants on that front yard slide? Uh, I, that's a good question, Anne, and I will uh, integrate that answer after I look that back up into a further workshop. But for planning, for a one gallon native plant, plan on spending 10 to $13 per plant. Uh, the yarrow, I was able to get all in four inch plants which are quite a bit cheaper. And so uh, what? That's, that's kind of a general uh, good guideline. Normally with plants, unless you're buying something super rare, and in most cases you are not, uh, normally you're kind of paying by size. And so planting all one gallon plants and then four inch, if you're doing like a big swap of something like the yarrow can help plan for that. So uh, if you're really inclined, you can go back and look at that picture and kind of roughly count things up. But uh, 
I would say over a thousand dollars and less than two thousand dollars i feel like is the full budget for that front yard and if you're really trying to fill area with an eye towards budget you could do more kind of shrubby or for the lower plants wide spreading plants and we had quite a bit of, of small plants especially in the little meadow and perennial area up against the house because a like one gallon sage that's going to be seven feet wide is going to be the same in terms of cost as a one gallon penstem and that'll be two feet wide. Uh, so for example, our backyard per square foot where we have more shrubs cost a lot less to plant than our front yard where there's more smaller information. Uh, next question from George. Could I show this slide before the one titled fun research, please? Uh, I can go back after I answer a few more questions. I will go back and, uh, oh, we're actually getting through a lot of our questions. Uh, okay, I will then, I guess I will go back and uh, try to find that, the one right before fun research. I don't have that many left. If, and if anyone else is left that does have more questions, uh, I am happy to take new questions as well. I'm going to exit out of this really quickly and scroll back through the slideshow. Okay, so you can let me know back into the question and answer or the chat if this is the one that you were looking for, George. If you are still with us. I'm pulling my chat and Q&A things back up. Okay. So are there sources for purchasing seeds to grow California native plants? Uh, I think we might have answered that one already, but maybe you weren't with us at the time. Janet, uh, yeah, so top sources locally would be California Botanic Garden, Theodore Payne Foundation, Tree of Life Nursery. And so all of those are on that uh, slide that we were just looking at with the local uh, plant sources. If you are looking to do a large area where you're gonna be wanting to buy the seeds in bulk instead of by the packet, one of my favorite online sources is Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. That's groworganic.com is their website. And they have a lot of wildflower mixes. They're not all California native wildflower mixes. They have some for other parts of the Southwest, other ones that are just plants from all over the place. So look at their California native mixes. Uh, they're a nice source for bulk because they'll sell it like by the pound, which is much more affordable than getting seed packets. If you wanna do a wide area, uh, they'll also sell like California poppies by the pound. If you're looking at them, they have a low growing California native mix that I am partial to and have used quite a bit for larger areas, it has a really nice mix of plants. Uh, can I please advise how to seed large meadow area for California native wildflowers? Uh, sure, I can. Oh, and Lisa, uh, sorry, on that same topic, I just saw Lisa in on the chat. I will type into the chat, that's grow organic for that uh, one source for the bulk of seed. So can I advise on how to seed a large meadow area for California native wildflowers? The first thing I will say, Sarah, is make sure you really want that because an area that's pure native wildflowers, uh, which you saw the dried out pictures of uh, we have at our house, can be quite a lot of work because there's not any of that permanent perennial or woody structure. It, there can be a lot of weeding involved the first year, especially for a wildflower meadow, uh, if, if there's any weed seeds there, it's a lot of work and it continues to be, uh, say per square foot, other than our vegetable garden, that's the highest maintenance area of our garden, even though we do let it go dry. Because even in the summer, there's a lot of local weeds that can survive, like little spurges and things with no additional water. So 
uh, we're always trying to pull those out before they can go to seed for the next year. And we know that we are not always going to want to maintain that large of an area for wildflowers, uh, but for the first few years, we've been willing to do it living here. So make sure you want that. Oftentimes a better approach, and you just might have a large area that you wanna do. Oftentimes I encourage people to use wildflowers as the, uh, the spaces in between other plants. So you're solarizing right now, that's great. You are off into a uh, good start until you have time to plant other fruit trees. Yeah, and I, I will often use wildflowers as temporary cover and to start getting the soil going and growing roots in between the fruit trees. So that's a great approach. And so generally what you're gonna wanna do is for the wildflowers, you uh, are going to want to scatter your seed. I like right before the first summer rain event. So I, I literally usually will have my seed ready to go. And I think it's a way of kind of welcoming the fall too that I just enjoy doing where if I can like the day before, depending on my schedule, two days before the rain, I will go out and scatter the seeds and then just very lightly uh, rake them in. Certain seeds will be fine just on the surface, but I try not to do it too far out ahead. And then I try to rake it in a little bit, just because if you do it too far ahead and leave it on the surface, uh, a lot of birds might eat a decent amount of the seeds. And so when I rake it in, what I make sure I do is I'll generally use a, uh, a hard landscape rake, but a flexible leaf rake can work as well. And very lightly, I will just rake back and forth with very small strokes, because all I'm trying to do is get the thinnest layer, eighth of an inch, no more than a quarter of an inch usually on top of those seeds. I don't want to bury them that deep. And if I do long strokes, like if I was raking up leaves, you'll pull a lot of the seeds to one side. So just little strokes back and forth. The other thing that you can do is you can cover it with just a little bit of soil or even like a compost product, like the, if it's gonna be easier for you, you can get in three cubic foot bales at the hardware store, a product called Topper, which is, which is like what you would scatter over lawn seed. And that has more fertility than your wildflowers would really need. But if you're just looking for a quick cover, uh, that could help. One trick for covering with an even light layer, depending on how large of an area you're doing, is a certain size of the flats that like four inch nursery containers come in. Sometimes they're really wide, uh, really wide, uh, kind of diamond shape. Sometimes they're closer together and there's less open. If you have one of those kinds of flats, you can put the the topper material in there and just kind of shake it and it acts as kind of a nice sifter to get a, a nice even layer. And so you can do that. If it's already wood chip mulched, uh, that's fine. California poppies have no problem coming up in wood chip mulch being lightly raked in. Clarkias do a really good job of that too. It's another beautiful later blooming wildflower. And that uh, low growing California native seed mix that I mentioned for wider areas, I've done that into wood chip mulch and lightly raked it in as well. And a good number of the different plants will come out as well. Uh, you don't want a super thick layer of wood chip mulch, but if that's what you already have, uh, that's kind of just fine. And so you definitely want to get it out before the first rains if you can. If you missed it right after is fine, but in the fall is critical. And then if it dries out a lot after the first rains, you might need to do some supplemental light watering. Again, the seeds are, are just germinating, so you don't necessarily need to water super deep, but just to supplement in between for the best results until the rain takes over. And then once the rain takes over and it's cooler, generally you can stop watering. And then on the spring side, a, an occasional watering every once in a while will keep them blooming for longer uh, instead of drying out and setting seeds as early after the rainy season. So hopefully that is helpful. So from Jenny, you talked about how most basic gardeners and nursery employers aren't necessarily skilled enough at recommending appropriate plants for landscaping for helping with design elements. Can you recommend persons, companies, or websites for help hiring out some of the process or redoing very challenging landscape? So in terms of landscape designers and contractors, I cannot uh, do that. We're a public agency, and so we just don't recommend private contractors. What I will say is the plant, the nurseries that I listed at the end of this as the local sources, there is also, if not soon, uh, next week, I will post our landscape suppliers list on, uh, 
on that same place, uh, cbwcd.org slash presentations that I, uh, that I, sorry, saw, saw another chat coming in, lost my train of thought. Uh, so it's going to have a list of local landscape suppliers. Those nurseries are going to be the ones that have staff that are the exception. And generally that staff is pretty well versed in making good individual plant recommendations, but can't really do a whole design for you right there. Although if you have you know, one or two areas where you're looking for some plants from and you bring in some pictures on your phone, they'll generally take a look and make some recommendations. In terms of not leaving you high and dry with where to find someone to help you further, I recommend that you talk to those nurseries. Oftentimes those nurseries because they're private businesses and a number of them are also wholesalers that sell to contractors and designers, they might be able to recommend people working in your area uh, that are available for hire. Okay, looking at, is there an email I can provide if you have additional questions. Uh, yes, I will type my email into the chat and I always do my best to get back to people with their questions, but on a weekly basis, uh, I'm often quite busy. So I would say be patient. I can't always get back to people right away, but I am interested in getting questions and do find that dialogue helpful because generally if people have questions for me, those are questions that other people in your same situation are wondering. So I am, I am pretty limited in terms of, you know, if you send me 50 pictures of your yard, uh, being able to give you very specific advice. If you are in our local area, uh, in our service area, and you can check on our website for where exactly that is. We do have a landscape design assistance program. So I'll just list it right now. If you are in the, if your water is provided by Monta Vista Water District, City of Upland, City of Ontario, Chino, Chino Hills, Fontana Water Company, or Monta Vista Water District, uh, you actually can qualify for a program where we will help you redesign your yard for those of you who are in our local area. And you can get the information about that. If you go to our website, you'll be able to find it. But if you go directly to cbwcd.org slash design assistance, that will get you to all the information about the program. Uh, but most of you are going to be from farther out. And uh, if you have general questions, you can reach me at uh, the email I'm putting into, spelling my name wrong, the email I'm putting into the chat right now. Okay, so some more questions. What is the best mulch to use considering California is seriously a regular fire area? So if you are in an urban area, uh, I guess it is up to you to figure out like how worried you are about that. But if you are in that urban, wire, urban wildland interface area, the general recommendations are I think it's within at least the first 30 feet of the house, don't use a wood chip mulch. And so it's going to be uh, gravel or decomposed granite. If you're on a slope, decomposed granite is not gonna work very well. So it would be gravel. And normally if you're gonna be using gravel mulches, what I encourage people to do is not just all get one size of gravel, it's not gonna look very good, but you're gonna to wanna to probably use a mixture of uh, everything from pea gravel to, so pea gravel is small gravel, uh, there's a three quarter inch size gravel, which is you know a little bit small, a little bit larger. Uh, there is usually an inch and a half size gravel from the kind of rock suppliers. Sometimes it's called drain rock. And then you can work with larger cobble and the occasional boulder. Important thing for all of those sizes is for, to have that natural kind of look, you wanna make sure it's not crushed. Crushed is good for structural things where you need the, to be able to compact and have it locked together, but it doesn't look natural, natural or that nice at all. Uh, you wanna make sure that it's just washed or sifted, but not crushed. 
and I generally, you know, encourage working with the, the local uh, rock in our area. It's often called river rock because that's going to have that nice natural look. And then in some areas farther out, you don't necessarily need mulch at all. Uh, it's just a light layer of the leaves that accumulate and then making sure if you're in that fire zone that you don't let too much of it accumulate. So from Sarah, you have 8,000 square feet where you want to create an orchard meadow. That's large. Uh, it can grow a lot of fruit trees there. Right now, it's under plastic solarization until fall. Don't have the time this year to plant all the trees, pathways, etc. I'm hoping that a mix of wildflowers will prevent weeds from reestablishing until I can complete the plan. Following the guidelines from your earlier class, want to put in overhead MP rotators. The seed supplier still received recommends one eighth to one fourth. Oh, okay. So I think that probably came in, Sarah, before we had that talk. And then, uh, okay. So I think I answered that. But uh, I will say, if you're still with us, Sarah, that I would love to see some pictures from your project as it goes, uh, if you'd be willing to, as that orchard meadow gets put together and comes in. And if it turns out nicely, then I'm sure it will. If you're doing all the research and putting the effort into, uh, I think it would make a great case study to share with the public later on. And I always love to have pictures that people other than I do uh, of pro projects in process. So if you ever feel like emailing me some pictures or getting in touch, that would be awesome. From Videhi, I apologize if I am uh, saying your name wrong. What to plant under oak trees? Good question. Uh, so I am going to assume and type back into the Q&A if I am wrong, that most of the time in Southern California, we have evergreen oak trees. A little bit farther north, there's more deciduous oak trees that lose their leaves in winter. But the evergreen oak trees uh, are kind of a challenge. The shade is pretty deep, the roots are pretty aggressive, and there's a lot of leaf litter. I will split that up a couple of different ways. A uh, couple of different ways based on the size of the oak tree and how much shade. If it's a well-established oak tree and you are in the zones where the shade is pretty constant, there's no direct sun, my favorite plant for that is Catalina perfume or Ribes viburnifolium. It's a, it's a plant from the Channel Islands, but it's just one of our great super tough ground covers that like shade underneath oak trees. And it does a really good job. It's a ground cover, but it kind of has these long arching stems. It stays pretty low, uh, especially if you plant it at the proper spacing, which is like five or six feet apart. Uh, seems really far apart compared to the size of the plant when you put them in, but it will fill in. If you plant them too close, it'll grow over each other and get quite a bit taller. And they just have, they have a remarkable ability to look very nice year round. And the oak trees kind of fall through in between the individual stems of it, the oak leaves. And so it's not a lot of maintenance. Other things that are good in areas that stay mostly shady underneath oak trees are hookras for a little bit more shade, also called coral bells. I like California fescue as a really beautiful uh, blue colored bunch grass that does well. And you can look uh, online. If you look at California, uh, what to plant underneath evergreen oak trees, you know, kind of Google searching, you can find some additional uh, information as well. But those are some of my favorites. Uh, yarrow the, that I showed as well, especially around the edge where it's not full, full, complete dark shade works really well. And the last thing I'll mention is the dwarf California coffee berries, or if you have really high oak trees, a lot of them toy on, all of those work well as well. Uh, from Alberto, I was in your Thursday class. Could you please repeat how to measure areas using Google Maps? So I will do that right now. We'll pull up a web browser uh, because that might be helpful to other people. So if you need to measure an awkward spaced or large area and you can't do that using measuring tapes, and this is relevant to a lot of people who are applying for the turf replacement rebates, there is a function in Google Maps that a lot of people don't know about that can help you. So I will go to Waterwise Community Centers, Garden and Park, just as an example. And so first thing you want to do is click on the lower left to get the satellite image and you can zoom in. 
So let's say you're removing, this is a much larger turf area than most people will be doing, but I want to pull it up because it's a kind of awkward area that would be very hard to measure and get into a good area uh, with a measuring tape. And so you can right click and click on measure distance and you can drag this dot to your first point and then simply connect the dots and it will start measuring just distance as you go and you can go back and correct these if you need to. I think you can even, uh, oh, you can't add an, in this one, but you can click on more. So say you're going to follow this curve and then you're going to go out this way and do something like that. And so you can see at the bottom, it's measuring the total distance. And then as soon as you close things, it gives you the total area right there. And so with that, let's get back into the slideshow. I think there is still a uh, request to show a different slide and I need to pull back up my questions and answers. Uh, so from Angie, is the Chino Basin Water Conservation District still doing free mulch these days? We are not having our mulch events because of uh, concerns with getting that many people in close proximity and sweating and breathing. But we are trying to figure out uh, something to where we can uh, try to figure out something to where we can have a safe place in our park to put a large pile that people can get at will. However, our mulch supplier, which is the Green Army, which is a place that serves uh, for like arborists and tree trimmers to drop off their stuff and they then make our mulch locally, has had some amount of ability to work with people to provide mulch to them, especially if you can take a drop off because they're also backed up because of other things going on in the landscape industry. So I will, uh, what's the best way to do that? You should, I don't have the direct information, but I'm going to go back to pulling up a website and provide you some contact information. Uh, general email hmm. there's an email that goes to the person who handles most of our public communications and i'll just give you her direct email uh, that should be fine and she should be able to connect you with that because it was in one of our most recent newsletters so I will type into the chat. So this is Omane's email, O-A. So if you email Omane and uh, ask her if you could, if she could provide you either a copy of the newsletter that had the information about the Green Army or that contact information, she should be able to get that back to you. And that would be for people in our, our local area uh, that would be you know, people who would, would normally drive to come to our uh, mulch giveaway. Okay, same question for plum tree that is large with branches and an umbrella shape bending up to the ground. What flowers or plants can go under? So that would be, I'm gonna consider that to be something that when the leaves are out it is pretty shady and then would be more sunny in the winter. So I would go with a lot of those plants that are also adapted to being on the north side of a house, uh, even though the situation is opposite. So, and then also plants that would be low enough that they wouldn't cause problems for the plum. So I think my two favorite for that situation would be either the yarrow or the California native strawberry, which would be, uh, it's just called California strawberry. Those are both ones that should be happy with the shade and then would be really happy with the more sunlight in the winter. So again, that has gotten us through everything in the Q&A, but I had seen a few more things in the chat, including uh, the request to put in some additional, to 
pull up one more of the panels. Okay. Um, so let's get back to George. Is it on the right slide? The one before fund research had a list of other resources. Is there one the original is shown? Always look up presentations website. I'm not sure, but I will pull up. Oh, for uh, for researching plants. Yeah, I think I think it is one that had resources. Oh no, we're lying. Is it that one? Or actually, let me put it up. I have at the end. I think those same resources would be at the bottom. At the end, I'll put up that one last slide, and then. And then uh, I'll let you look it up after I post the presentation if that's not the right one. But this slide, I'm going to pull up, has most of our resources. So there's this one with the plant sources and plant information. I'll leave that up for a few minutes and then I'll bring it over to this one, which has our web links for most of the stuff that we talked about. So we have from, from Lisa, what are some mistakes you can share that you have made in design or planting? Oh my gosh. Plenty, let me think. I tell people that I I know what I know about plants. I have done a lot of research. I've talked to a lot of people. I've picked a lot of people's brains, but ultimately uh, I've killed way more plants than most of the people I've known. And I've tried to figure out why when I've done it. And over time you start to accumulate some stuff. So I think the main thing is not planting plants too close together. That would be the main thing, especially for native plants. So many of them grow so vigorously that I have made so many mistakes, even in my professional work, planting things too close together. And a lot of times it didn't require replanting, but just in retrospect, I, I wished I had planted things a little farther apart. When you go through a formal design training program, normally what they will train you to do is to reference the full size that a plant is going to be, the full width, and then crowd plants just a little bit closer together. Uh, something like 25% closer than, than what would be the canopies touching. And that might work if you're working with like perennial planting and kind of styles of landscaping that happen in other parts of the world. But with a lot of our native plants, I find really I'm a lot more successful if I just anticipate planting them the full size of the plant away from each other. And some of our native plants are just grow so vigorously that they'll even get larger than you are uh, anticipating. So really spacing things out. And then what I've done for, especially the plants that I've thought that I planted too close together is I literally have gone out into those gardens or when I'm at a botanical garden, I carry a little uh, 12 foot measuring tape with me a lot of the times, which just slides into a pocket and I will measure the mature size of that plant as I see it and take that information into account. If you do plant plants too closely, if it's just a little bit too closely, then uh, if it's just a little bit too closely, then you can do a little bit of extra pruning. If there's quite a bit, you're gonna have to remove some plants most likely. So uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, I think the number one, uh, number one thing I would mention. And then I guess the other one that I've found myself uh, prone to do, and I'll say I realized I was doing it at the time and just taking an experimental approach. But most of the time when I've taken this approach in my own yards, uh, it just hasn't worked out well is I've sometimes found myself in a situation where I don't have enough true full sun in some of the places I've lived because of established trees to grow all of the full sun needing native plants that I really like. So sometimes I will, uh, I would sneak a plant that 
a really no needs full sun into an area that doesn't get much full sun. And normally, you know, maybe they'll do okay for the first year, but long term, that pretty much does not work out. Uh, okay, let's see if there's anything else. And I will also say that, speaking of those, uh, even the best landscape architects and planting designers make mistakes and either the ones that don't realize it, uh, I'm kind of cynical about landscape architects because I also, uh, so I was trained as a landscape architect, but I've spent uh, more years uh, doing horticulture management that uh, big name landscape architects with good reputations often make a lot of mistakes and then they leave the project and three years later they're not there when the grounds crew or the maintenance crew is needing to replace the plants that they didn't put in correctly or put in the wrong areas or oftentimes put too close together uh, and the best planting designers and landscape architects realize that you never get it perfect perfect the first time and will keep a uh, long-term relationship with the client where they will come back a few years later and do some touch up and kind of make uh, make some corrections to push that whole system off in the, the right direction. So yeah, don't don't put the pressure on yourself to do it perfectly the first time. Uh, nobody ever does it. So oh, good 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 point, Lisa. As I'm going up through the comments, uh, she mentioned another thing that she's done is uh, plants too close to pathways. Uh, definitely, yeah, definitely not thorny or pokey plants too close to pathways, but I've also done that with just native shrubs, especially with the perennials, the smaller plants, they generally don't get too big out of hand, but sometimes the native shrubs will get a foot, two feet bigger than you think. And if you're planting a shrub that goes right up against the edge of a narrow pathway, it's really easy for it to get quite a bit overgrown. So what I tend to do if it's going to be a narrow pathway is I tend to make sure I hold the shrubs back even extra. So if they get larger than I think they're going to get, that pathway is still functional. And then I'll put like a few perennials or just seasonally sprinkle a little wildflower seed uh, towards that end. Okay. Let's see, going a little bit farther back. There is more. Uh, recommendation for permeable paving for a driveway that slopes slightly. Uh, depends on how much the slope. Permeable paving can be awesome for a driveway. Uh, those options, because they generally need a pretty significant subgrade of compacted road base as well, uh, can be pretty expensive. So it's going to depend on your budget. But if you are thinking about doing it for a driveway that slopes slightly, you might look into a product called gravel pave, which is a gravel colored. So normally it's a light gray, you get it in different colors, uh, structural plastic grid that goes on top of like the same road base that would be on top of uh, underneath concrete or something. And that grid will hold a small size like pea gravel in place, uh, kind of fills, fills that in. And it also provides the structural integrity for the cars to roll over it. So that would be one of my favorite options. Or uh, there's also, what are called unit pavers. So those are gonna be like uh, cast concrete. You can get them in different styles and colors, actual pavers, but there's slight gaps in between that get that then gets filled with a sand or a small aggregate instead of them being mortared together, which then allows them to be permeable. Uh, and I think with that, uh, that gets us, oh, okay, we have a question from Dennis. Not sure if I mentioned, but what is a good reliable source for wood chips? Depends on where you are. Uh, you can, and it depends on where you are and what you want. So my favorite uh, wood chip in general is gonna be mixed arborist trimming. So not one specific source, but ground up uh, grinds of various different trees, as long as they're healthy, of various different species. Easiest, and cheapest way to get a hold of that is to either be in contact with a local tree trimmer in your area. Sometimes if someone's just trimming trees in your neighborhood, you can ask them if they want to drop off what they have. Uh, or there is also a, a app called Chip Drop that you can sign up for that's free that basically networks with local arborists and you tell uh, give them certain information. It's basically telling them that if there's an arborist with that in your neighborhood, 
you know, they can leave the wood chips wherever. However, with all those services, uh, quality is not guaranteed. And you generally need to take an entire truckload of mulch. And that could be way more than someone with a small garden would need. And it's quite a bit to move. So it also depends on your neighborhood. Uh, so I've had full loads in my driveway. Sometimes it takes over a month for me to get through it if I'm busy working and my neighbors don't really care. That would be a problem in certain neighborhoods, especially if you're gonna have it dropped on the street. Uh, that's technically in, in a lot of uh, cities, you need to get a permit for that and you have like 72 hours to move it all. And then if you are purchasing it, you can uh, connect with your local landscape yards. If you're local to us, uh, two sources of that are Ontario Building Materials and Wolfenbarger. Uh, in Ontario and Chino, and those will have, you can still get the same stuff, but you, they also uh, have different kind of sizes and you can look at samples and really choose exactly what you're going to get. It will be quite a bit more expensive, but you can get uh, with a delivery fee, whatever amount you're looking for delivered at the exact time you're looking for it. Um. looking to see if there are any other questions. Okay, how do I know if a plant can resist harsh sun, since I mentioned full and harsh are different? Sun 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, and so it, it also depends on where you are. I would say if you are in inland summer heat, the shrubs that are rated for full sun will be just fine if you are getting reflected heat also off of you know walls or buildings or whatever those might be an area for some of the desert shrubs and then the perennials the smaller flowering plants uh you know things that are a foot or less tall and two or three feet wide those might do better again big generalization grouped to where they will eventually get a little bit of shade during part of the day from those shrubs, either in the morning or the afternoon. So kind of like in relationship with those shrubs. There's exceptions to the smaller stuff that can take that full blasting sun, but that would be a good general maybe rule to go by if you're inland. If you're on the coast, uh, you have to worry about that a lot less, or if you're in like Los Angeles proper or something like that, Orange County. Jim, who's still with us from a while ago, can coyote bush be trained into a knot garden? Uh, yeah, it can, like formal hedging. Uh, there's actually a labyrinth at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden done with coyote brush. However, I will say that uh, the, the straight normal species of coyote brush does tend to, uh, if it's going to be like a low, less than knee high kind of hedge, that tends to get a little bit bare at the base but there is a hybrid between two different species of coyote bush called centennial. And that centennial uh, tends to stay leafed out pretty low. There is a beautiful low hedge of it at the California or the Los Angeles Natural History Museum. It can be a little bit harder to find or harder to find from the nurseries, but if you are going to try to do something kind of formal hedging with that, I would definitely wait and try to get a hold of or even try to work with the nursery to get it in advance of the season, you know, make sure that they're going to put some aside for you if they will. Uh, I would, I would try to go with that centennial cultivar. Um, from Cindy, where did I get the big boulders and flat rocks for my backyard? Uh, I actually don't have any large boulders because all of our larger, well, I guess it depends what you consider large. I think our largest rocks are about a foot wide, uh, which for boulders is on the smaller end, but those are all anything other than gravel. Uh, I actually dug out, out of my backyard as we were moving soil around. Had a little bit more gravel than we would want to, but it created a lot of good material. Uh, but for things like that, you can call up local landscape supply yards or some of them are stone yards. And you can normally find things like that uh, where they charge by the pound. Let's see if there's anything else. I think we've got to most of these. 
I think we have oh, a couple more coming in on the Q&A and then we will wrap up. Oh, we've already talked about those. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. It's been a lot of fun uh, presenting this and having so much good question and answer with you all. It's just seeing if any of these are new questions coming in or just comments. Uh, hope you join us for future programs especially uh, using this in conjunction with, again, that habitat workshop that we have, the favorite plants workshop that we already have online, and then coming up the irrigation workshop that we're going to have talking about converting lawn irrigation to water-wise gardens. There's a lot of stuff in there, even if you're not converting your lawn, that will be relevant to just setting up new irrigation systems. And then definitely that installation and establishment of California native plants. Even if you're planning on working with a contractor that will give you some tips that are not standard that contractors would necessarily know that you can use to direct them to setting up your native gardens for the best success. So with that, we will consider it uh, the end of a workshop. Hope you have a good rest of your weekend, everybody, and hope to connect with you in future workshops.